Greetings, I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to our bi-monthly stream with good friends Matt and David over at Left Reckoning. Sadly, show producer and headless, faceless voice of reason, MT will not be with us this week. But we have an informative show for you planned nonetheless. Also, after the show, if you're a patron, and even if you're not, we've got free champagne. That's right. We won't be going behind a paywall to hide the fun. We're going to have it all here for you live. So if you enjoy these complimentary champagne nights, then you know what to do. Please hit like, subscribe, and of course, the notifications bell. So you're alerted whenever we go live. I will say, when MT's here, we're usually a little bit more on time. I blame Pascal. It's Pascal's fault. I would relate. I, I hate I hate to do it. That's why we're tardy. We would have been here on time. But Pascal had he had his hair and makeup people. He has hair and makeup people. And uh, they had to tend to him as he was getting ready. He's kind of a diva uh, behind the closed doors. But for those of you that are subscribers, thank you for your continued support. If you'd like to wear your support for the channel, you can let the people know with TIR merch. That's right. You can wear the diva himself's smiling face on a t-shirt. You can have it on a mug or a mouse pad and have people at your office say, who the fuck are those people on the damn mouse pad? If you like access to champagne rooms, past and present, become a patron. It's simple. And for as little as $3, you can join us for movie night and participate in the Mau Mau Hour. Also, don't forget, January 22nd, we're going to be live in New York City, bringing the Give Them a Revolution show to the East Coast. Special guests, Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin. Bashkar Sankara, Deep State Cuba, allegedly Gene Bajlan, and possibly this gentleman will be with us. Let's bring in the crew. Please welcome my homie, my dog, my co-host, the man of the Mau Mau Hour, who had an excellent show. If you haven't seen it, please check it up. It's up right now. Pascal deconstructs the political rise Hakeem Jeffries and tells us why it could be a very troubling rise. Please welcome the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to Jason Miles. Don't blame me for starting the show late. Don't do that. <laughs> it's all jokes, folks. Pass the or was it? Also coming live from, uh, he's actually coming live from us from Korea. Um, he's everyone's favorite producer and show co-host. We get to be co-hosts for live events now. Mr. Matt Leck. Hello everyone, yes. Uh, I'm here at the Parasite House, which I rented on Airbnb. <laughs> uh, I, I picked this because uh, David Griskin was confused by watching a stream that uh, Pascal was doing where he had the uh, stock background house, which is, uh, it looks like right. this. Uh, I thought that was Pascal's house. <laughs> I think we should... <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> and, and let's bring in everyone's favorite Texan. Um, it's between this man and Jerry Jones. Please welcome David Griscom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. Nothing wrong with me being excited that, you know, my friend Pascal is doing well down there in South Florida. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I do have to acknowledge this comment. Jason looks like he's on set about to dance in the rain for his lover's affection. Maybe I am, goddammit. Maybe I am. But it's good to know that that's what my winter outfit looks like. <laughs> because you said that, I'm going to start publishing pictures of Pascal dressed like Jodeci in the 90s. You gonna tell me you didn't have one of them long trench coats, Pascal? Not like Jodeci, no. <laughs> you know what's funny? Matt and David are so young, they have no idea who Jodeci is. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. They are that young. What year were you born, David? 92. 90 something? 92, oh my yeah. god, it's yeah, scary. Yeah, yeah. That's, oh <laughs> you know what we need to do? We need to do a DC live show and just take David to all these black ass black clubs where they play nothing but music from the 90s. Oh, hell yeah. I love Go Go. That's that's oh, the plan. I'm impressed that he even knows Go Go. I, like, oh. I lived in DC plan. for like six years, man. Oh, that's right. You went to college in DC. Yeah. Not a lot of fun. I know. Go, yeah, go. What, if, what if we took David to the club and they were like, David? <laughs> <laughs> no, you never know. He David was thinking some like DC. Like, I know here. all the spots, fool. Y'all niggas don't know jack shit about DC. <laughs> we walk in the 930 club and fucking. I know the 930 club alone. very well. <laughs> <laughs> Because Matt's not much older than you. I'm uh, I'm uh, born '88, tail end, right, very end of '88. Actually, it's gonna be my birthday in uh, four days. Uh, me and oh, George Armstrong. Why very... didn't you remind us? We would have done a birthday thing. Well, probably for that reason. I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a birthday thing for Pascal, where we are asking people to send videos, and we're going to make. Uh, a huge birthday montage and we're going to have a stream where people get to come in and wish Pascal happy birthday. I did speak with Marcus. So he's going to come by and wish you a happy birthday. Okay, sounds good. So I'm I'm excited for the Pascal <laughs> birthday, the Christmas holiday party. It'll be an extravaganza. Oh yeah. Are you ready for that, Pascal? I'm ready to rock and roll. You'll be turning 25 for the third time. <laughs> Speaking of getting old and births, David Griscom, let's start the show off with you. We All hit right. eight, the eighth billionth, eighth billion, eighth billionth person in the world. Some people are alarmed. Some people shrug their shoulders. Some people don't even know how many people live in their city. <laughs> how should we feel about this, David Grisco? Well, um, I might make this a little quick because I definitely I'm one track mind on this rail strike thing these days. <laughs> I don't want to get into that, but I do care about this too. I've just been, yeah, I don't know. Um, I want to talk about this piece because it was written by our good friend uh, Matt Huber and Jacobin. We should celebrate the world's uh, population passing the eight billion mark. And, you know, the, the piece is really a response um, to what happened once we hit the population of 8 billion is that there are a lot of really kind of anti-human articles being published in places like The Guardian magazine. And, you know, it, it, one, I think for obvious reasons, people should start getting nervous when you start hearing people talk about population uh, because you know where that goes. Um, particularly, I think people on the left should also care about that when you realize where population is growing in the world. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's parts of the world that have already been hyper exploited. And beyond all of that, though, it's just it's a really backwards way of looking at a lot of the real problems that we face. Right. It goes back to, you know, a very Malthusian idea yes. of the problems in society where. Um, for people who aren't familiar, Malthus was like this very famous political economist in the 19th century um, who basically argued that as population grew, there were going to be crises uh, because there wasn't going to be enough land to sustain people. Well, we learned that Malthus was wrong. 
um, because our productive capacities through technology, through better systems, um, more productive systems increased and our ability to basically be able to produce more than a kind of late feudal early capitalist system um, could meant that more and more people could you know survive and live and remember when we're talking about high population what we're talking about is women not dying in childbirth mm -hmm. we're talking about people not dying at 25 30 from preventable diseases this is something that we should see as a good thing it's a good thing that people are able to live full lives it's a good thing that women aren't dying um, in childbirth in the rates that they were you know 100 years ago and um, what it really gets down to what the push of this is is sort of pushing back against this kind of anti-human tendency that we're seeing on people on the left and particularly in the environmental movement that treats the problems of capitalism as if they are problems of nature and what i mean by that is we have productive capacity to be able to fill, feed people we have the technology to be able to house people the reason that there's poverty and there's suffering in the world today is because the system we have is unjust the system that we have is inefficient the system that we have fails us and these kind of lazy arguments that it's like, oh, well, there's too many people now. That's why there's a housing crisis. There's too many people now. That's why there's an unemployment crisis. One have like if you take those things to their end, you know, logical level, get really nasty really quickly. And two are completely wrong because it lets the capitalist class off um, the hook. And I highly suggest people read um, Matt Huber's uh, piece about it. Um, in, in Jacobin, but he has a few great lines here. I'll just you know look at a couple of them. He says, nobody who takes themselves to be interesting, interested in creating a fair world should accept the idea that any human being is superfluous. Um, and a, a longer text here, I think, is really gets to the crux of the argument is that solving climate change will require taking social control over investment through public ownership and or worker control to unleash society's technological capacities toward decarbonization. This would allow us for the first time in human history to finally build a society organized in the rational interests of the majority. Economic planning would allow society to build infrastructure to deliver clean electricity, public housing, and modern water and waste management to the billions of, quote, surplus humanity capitalism deemed superfluous, right? And that's a system that we have. It creates people who are supposed to be on the margins of society, it creates unemployed people, it creates hungry people to be that kind of reserve army of labor. And again, if you think that this is a natural thing, right? Um, then what complaint can you really have about the system, right? There's just the way that the world works. Um, and I completely reject that, that idea. I think it's really important that we reject that idea and recognize that to do the things that we want to do, to build public housing for, for everyone, to, you know, to provide food for folks, to have electricity, that's going to take a lot of investment and more growth and more productive capacity. And we should embrace those things instead of rejecting them for these kind of, I don't know, pre-modern fantasies that some people have that we can all go back and live like a kind of subsistence lifestyle. Um, the promise of socialism has always been um, not just absence of suffering of capitalist exploitation, but real abundance and free time and ability to live your life. And to do that, uh, we should be utilizing the technology and the productive capacity that we have for the betterment of all. The system we have right now only works for, you know, a few folks. And just lastly, you know, um, one of these things is that, you know, one of the favorite lines and Huber writes about this in his piece, too, of like some of the degrowthers, the people who want a cold population. Um, not that the degrowthers necessarily say that I'm saying other people who want a cold population is that if the world lived the way that Americans live, then, you know, we would overrun um, like the capacities of the earth four times over. And it's one of those arguments that, again, is just ex extremely cruel when you think about we live in a country, despite its wealth, where there's a lot of hungry people, there's a lot of homeless people, um, there's a lot of people who are pushed, pushed out into the margins. Um, so I have a hard time accepting the idea that this is sort of the height of, of humanity and we need to cap productive capacity and, and growth here. Um, we should be celebrating and trying to find ways to take these systems under public ownership so that we can use them in rational ways that actually feed people, house people, and provide better lives for ourselves and stop getting worked up about kind of nonsensical things like the population is is getting uh, too big. Eight billion people is a really incredible human achievement when you think about uh, what that means for folks' lives. People's lives are better, um, people can live longer, and uh, we should be pushing uh, to expand those capacities and not you know, getting worked up that you know more people are able to live today. <laughs> It just means that my child support bill is bigger, dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that means. Pascal, do you have something to say about that? I think that was a really great 
breakdown of how Malthusian uh, pessimism, mm. which is really predicated on theories that end up in scenes like population control, population extermination, then even more horrible things that we can think about that have been used by you know empires throughout history to try to cull the herd in mm -hmm. order to protect the wealth of the empire is really these problems are a product of distribution of wealth and resources and capital yes as opposed to populations themselves i mean the fact that the united states is a country that makes up something like four percent of the world's population but uses something over 30 percent of the world's resources some say 35 demonstrates that the problem is not with population it's that distribution of resources are focused in the capitalist global north to the extent that the rest of the world is basically being denied anything that they need to do to really effectively survive in the current 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 uh global economy and what i like about what dave is saying is that he's not saying that we all need to go live like pastoral herbalists and, <laughs> and his answer is that we need to be able to have a kind of economic paradigm <laughs> we can modernize things for the globe mm -hmm. under a rubric of public ownership that still takes in consideration the demands of the global economy and the environment and I, I salute that 100 and if i could just add one thing it's just like the other thing too is that like even in like countries like the united states even in places like you know the united kingdom the stuff's not distributed very well either, right? So this is one of those things where you have a lot of potential for real global solidarity because there's a lot of people being pushed out to the margins um, that I think sometimes, you know, that's why you have to have a class analysis, I think, you know, uh, on top of all things, um, because all Americans aren't the same in that way. Mm -hmm. Man, I love, uh, I love pastoral herbalists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the solutions are getting really... Uh, dark around like what people uh consider surplus populations like eric adams is all about oh, we're going to uh force mentally ill people uh into treatment regardless of uh if they're violent or not like it does seem like a lot of the concerns that we had on this front on the environment front the eco-fascist um uh, malthusian front like that's it's starting to come into focus in a way that uh is uh troubling I, I saw a little bit of that uh, Eric Adams thing in, uh, yeah. before we even go into the rail strike uh, stuff. Pascal, did you want to address any of the Eric Adams stuff? No, I mean, Eric Adams is the he's a cop. He's the police state. He, he, you know, he basically believes that increasing the capacity of the police state to enforce laws is the way you govern a city. And for him, he want, you know, he comes from the law and order kind of mentality about what governance means. And because we have a crisis of homeless, largely because of COVID, his reaction is, like, well, we're going to involuntarily hospitalize these people. He doesn't say how for how long or how we have any kind of quality care. Who's going to pay for this? What kind of Medicare, medical care they're going to have? And just lock them up. You know, what does that look like? Does that look like you're gonna put them in a criminal facility before you send them to the hospital? I mean, it's, it's uh... there's different levels of function too, and I think the problem with blanket uh, kind of characterizations of the unhoused, meaning like, well, there's a lot of mentally ill. It's like, well, yeah, but what does that look like? I dealt with people that were severely mentally ill, but they function very different than people that you have to almost quarantine off from everyone else because they're so violent you know what i mean right and like there was a guy that was not violent at all at all but he would see spiders everywhere so we'd have to kill invisible spiders there's actually a video of me somewhere that's he <laughs> took kill invisible spiders it was i mean he had fun with it we had fun with it um not making fun like killing the spiders like oh we got to kill the spiders for this guy again but that's not a problem do you want to lock that guy up because he's saying that there's spiders everywhere he's not pulling off his skin he's not yelling at people he's just saying hey man there's a spider right there you need to kill it what about that one did you kill that other one over there you know that we didn't know if he was messing with us half the time or if he really was seeing spiders mm -hmm. um so that's a dangerous precedent to set and it's also extremely dangerous to kind of have blanket characterizations of uh what mental illness uh, looks like and then how it should be dealt with 
how do we want to deal with it? I think it's more of a sign of, you know, kind of how this society really wants to function that anything that isn't in the quote unquote norm, let's just throw it in a box and, and move it out of our sight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I certainly trust the NYPD with uh, determining what mental illness <laughs> <is>. <laughs> Yeah, that's another thing that's scary. Like, do you really want NYPD? And, and ultimately, I can only speak for what I've seen in California. Police officers generally, especially made more major metropolitan areas, they don't really want to mess with people like that. They don't want to have people that are covered in feces or piss themselves. That's the last person they would really want to deal with. Um, I can't speak for New York. Maybe those dudes um, have fun, you know, messing with those people. Um, I've not had good relations with the police in New York. That being said, let's move on to the rail worker strike. I wrote this whole thing and I have these quotes that I want you guys to talk about. It looks like a possible railroad strike might be averted as the Senate has pushed through a bill to force unions to accept a tentative agreement between the rail workers and management to make the imminent strike illegal. The sticking point for workers beyond pay was paid sick leave with the bill only allocating for one day of paid leave. From an article in NPR, the sick leave effort was meant to ease concerns from labor unions and some lawmakers, despite Biden's request not to alter the carefully negotiated underlying deal. Advocates have been asking for a paid sick leave policy to be put in the contract for months. The deal negotiated by the Biden administration only included one paid personal day, causing some unions to reject it, creating the threat of a rail worker strike as soon as December 9th. Some senators like GOP senators Marco Rubio, Josh Hawley, and Ted Cruz have come out strongly against any measure that doesn't include more paid sick days for workers. I think the labor bosses and the Biden administration screwed over workers cutting a deal they don't support, Rubio said. I don't think Congress should be in a position of having to negotiate labor deals, but if we're forced to do so, then I'll only support one that at least nods towards what workers' priorities are. So we'll see how it plays out. They were joined by progressives. In a joint statement issued after the House vote, a dozen Democratic senators urged the Senate leadership to take up both House passed bills to support the workers. Congress can and must make this agreement better, they said in the statement. For nearly three years, our nation's rail workers have been fighting on the front lines of the pandemic. They have kept our trains on the track, even while facing unprecedented challenges. Now the railroads transport most of our fertilizer, oil, gas, all the scary stuff, like 30 to 40 percent of the goods we use in this country. What would that mean for the American people if we do see a rail strike? We saw West Virginia a few years ago, the teacher strike, which became a wildcat strike, have positive results. Will we see some solidarity with solidarity strikes and other uh, jobs? Why is the GOP on the side of the worker? Matt, David, Pascal, I ask you these questions. Who wants to go first? I think, David, you're already warmed up. You've been in the gym. Uh, <laughs> jumpers already, if you want to start off. Uh, I mean, well, the GOP doesn't have their back. You can see that in the fact that in the Senate, um, the vast majority of them voted no on the seven-day um, agreement. Well, what they were able to do um, was when it came to forcing workers to accept a tentative agreement in the Senate, um, more GOP senators voted no uh, than Democrat um, than, than Democrats voted no. I believe it was Bernie Sanders, Warren, um, and, and like two or three others. I think it was something like four Democrats, Bernie Sanders, and then 10 Republicans uh, voted against it. So, I mean, on the Republican thing. It's the, uh, we all know what that is. It's cynical. It's you're seeing Biden doing something really unpopular and really nasty um, mm -hmm. and finding a great way to make the argument that like, see what happens when you vote for Democrats. They don't fight for you. 
um you know the the other side of that is that trump's president in this moment and this vote comes up you're not seeing any of those folks uh break away but i mean it's a it's it's a truly like disgusting moment i think in in our country's labor history and on top of that is like you know we talk about the sick days a lot but i think it's really damn important to remember the fundamental issue here that is what they're the the senate and the congress and joe biden are denying people is their right to collectively bargain their right to withhold their labor if they don't want to accept that contract and their right to decide if they want to accept a contract congress is taking away that right on joe biden's orders and that is absolutely unacceptable progressives in the in the house tried this gambit um um which we could all see was going to fail i find it to be absolutely unacceptable that anyone who has like a dsa endorsement uh voted uh to deny people their their rights to be able to strike um the only one who stood with the dsa position on this was rashida talib um you've heard a lot of back talk um from members like aoc saying well we were in co consult uh with union leaders about what they wanted us to do the reasoning for that and the things that she's cited have been sort of vague and strange. And it's also critical to remember um, that when we're talking about these negotiations, what kept on happening? The leaders negotiated a contract with the bosses. They brought it back to the membership and the membership said no. So when you're saying you're talking to those folks, I don't really feel like you're talking to the right um to the right people i mean i think it's i think it's a, a really dark day I, I i talked about this for like an hour already so i'm curious to hear um, <laughs> you know what what you all think about it but i i i'm i'm beyond uh livid about this i i, I find it to be a really despicable and and sad moment in uh you know trying to build this kind of political alternative that i think a lot of us has been sort of dedicating a lot of our hopes and time to well, I mean, that's why I wanted to bring up the West Virginia teacher strike, because if you if you guys remember, and, and it feels like, you know, these things are happening so, so often that we forget that the union told them to not strike. They voted down the strike and the teachers in the entire state. And I don't know if you guys spent much time in West Virginia. That's one of the few places where I was given a warning. So the fact that all those teachers got together and we're all on the same page, you know, it says something about uh, the solidarity of workers and what happens when we do come together. Pascal, what say you? I want to echo something that Strom McCollum said that I find very, very disconcerting. The MAGA movement is going back to the whole economic populism thing yep. that it was all about in 2016. Yep. I think that the fact that Rubio, Cruz, Tim Scott, and all these other corporate Republicans were given the opportunity to posture progressive on a labor issue by the Biden administration with the assist by the squad and many of the so-called quote-unquote DSA members in Congress really should give us pause and make us question whether this Democratic Party entryism strategy that so many people have been proposing since the rise of Sanders in 2016 was worth it? Are we just setting ourselves up for further disappointment under the guise of furthering the career of a lot of political careerists in the House that aren't really going to lay down and fight in order to protect their uh, you know, favorite chair or position on some committee or some kind of administrative slot that they have if they've worked up with the hierarchy of the Democratic Party that's always going to be paying fealty to the corporate forces. Look, we're moving to a Democratic House majority now. We have someone like Hakeem Jeffries who's mm -hmm. going to be running things, which means eventually if the control of the House flips over, he's going to be Speaker of the House. He already has open contempt for the progressive left within the House of Representatives, and he's not going to tolerate even the amount to which these people have been trying to pretend they're trying to stand up to the corporate normal functioning democratic party so what that's gonna what is what what his leadership portends for the future is that the corporate democrats are back in control and they're going to play hardball what are the progressives going to do even though they've expanded with the last electoral victory in november what i think what they're going to do is demonstrate but what we saw just happen now they're going to capitulate because they're still within the ranks of the democratic party so how exactly does this address this strategy that was thought to be the way in which we reform the Democratic Party from within. 
Matt, do you have anything you'd like to add? I, I would just uh, echo a couple of things. I mean, I shared this or she did to leave a tweet here, Jason. Oh, let me hear. I'm going to put it up. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in a union household. Uh, collective bargaining is a key to economic justice. Uh, today, our Congress not only voted to impose a contract on workers who rejected it, but the GOP and Manchin uh, also failed to include the paid sick days. But it says like our Congress, right? And like, I like that she's been forthright about this because I still see like posts by uh, Ilhan Omar and AOC who are smart enough to know that people can see through this. Um, little game where they're going to give themselves a little bit of credit for failing in a, some sort of valiant fashion with this sort of Jayapal uh, uh, strategy of uh, and and everyone knew this right like there was talk that and AOC and all these folks right before we went live on Tuesday were talking about oh no we need we can, we need we can't do this uh, we need to make sure they get their sick days. And then overnight, and David and I noticed Jayapal didn't wasn't the one wasn't saying anything about that publicly, mm-hmm. uh, while everyone else was. And this is what you get is them. Uh, and I I think it's interesting that like AOC and Ilhan they like how it would still would have passed if they voted uh, like no. uh, Talib. So yeah. like who were they signaling to with those votes, like? it's it's incredibly uh, insulting and yeah i think um i think it does uh call for a reassessment i like that like i've seen dsa chapters talk about um well we distance ourselves obviously from all but the squad um uh, all but uh to leave because this is you know a line that shouldn't be crossed the, the thing is is that like when you have um uh, this opportunity, like, you know, again, like the right wing shit is, is, is bullshit. I think everyone should be able to see through that. Right. But you give them that opportunity to be able to talk to disaffected folks. Right. And that's a huge loss. And that's why it's not just a symbolic protest vote, for example, for the squad to vote no on forcing the tentative agreement. Right. It is actually saying like, no, we don't accept this at all. And like, we are the ones who have your side. We might not be have the majorities right now to flip the you know, the votes in one direction or not, but by capitulating, it's like, well, what's the point of continuing to support that? Like, secondly, like, here's the thing at the end of the day, like, I, I, I really reject some people always come up with these kind of conspiratorial ideas about like the squad, like they're mm-hmm. sitting together. It's like, how can we demobilize the movement? How can we keep, <laughs> keep people hooked on this? Thing? I think it's much more likely that these people have bad politics and that's a problem. That's not saying let them off the hook, but like, that's much more of, of a reality in my opinion than like any kind of grand conspiracy. But here's the real problem. I don't care about the Democratic Party. I also don't get holy about the idea of um, saying, oh, we're not going to run on that line. Like if we make the argument that there's two corporations that control ballot access and we can utilize that to get power, that's fine with me. But that has always come with the ideas like it needs to be a very clear line of uh, delineation between the Nancy Pelosi Democratic Party and Biden and what like the squad or the DSA or Bernie Sanders represent. And this is a moment where that line is not clear at all. And that's why it is just such an abject failure. If you're going to take that risk, because it is a risk, right? It's a gamble to say you're going to participate in this party. We know the line. The Democratic Party is the graveyard of social movements. We all know this shit. Um, but if you're going to take that risk, you have to be aggressive. You have to be antagonistic. And you're seeing right now that there is, has been a weakness for a long time about being that. And this is one that like you can't play around with. Right. This is not I mean, I don't know. Some people got really worked up about the Capitol Police funding. I'm not really into voting for more funding, but like I didn't find that to be like the end all be all betrayal. This right. one yeah. feels really bad to me. Yeah. Right. Because the whole point of this is that if a vote for fucking workers go, trying to go on strike comes up, you got some people in Congress who are going to stand with them. This is is bad. I mean, if I could just say one last thing, mm-hmm. what it really shows to me is this. We could be mad at the, the votes and we should be. And that's not letting these folks off the hook. But this that's a symptom of a larger problem of disorganization, lack of power, lack of structure. Right. AOC gets was like a member of DSA for like a couple, like a very short period of time before she got sent to Congress. Right. It's not somebody she who's rooted. Ted, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kennedy. Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. You know, and like and whatever, you know, like that. that's, you know, whatever's in people's past is in their past. But the point is that this is not somebody who's cultivated from that movement to be a representative of it. And then they get into Congress and that's not open line of communication. From what I understand, I think Tlaib actually has the closest like local chapter membership relationship out of all of them. And I think you can see that in that kind of vote right there. 
Um, so, you know, what this sucks. I mean, it's just, it's just, I'm miserable about it. Um, but I think that to be constructive instead of just like being mad about it is to recognize like that the fundamental problem has to be, I mean, the, the solution has to be finding a way to get out of this organizational, uh, morass that we're, that we're in. And I don't have the quick and easy solution to that, but like the point is like, this is a symptom of like a fundamental problem that we have right now that we're a lot more disorganized and a lot weaker than I think, um, sometimes we consider ourselves to be. And this was a very clear example of that. Pascal. Well, I appreciate David really coming coming to grips with that reality and being straightforward and be like, yo, listen, this is kind of grim. And I, listen, I, I, I'm not one of those, you know, some people call them ultra leftists or, or like, you know, people on the margins is like, oh, I told y'all, you know, this was never going to work. And but I actually don't want I don't see it being valuable that the progressives or the Sanders faction or the DSA people fail. I'm not one of those yeah, leftists of course. who want them to fail because I'm also not one of those leftists who believe that the only thing that will save anything is revolution and any form of reform is not going to do anything. We do this because we want to improve the material conditions of people's lives. And until there is a moment of fracture within the ruling class that allows for actual real revolution, not people pumping their fists like it's 1972, then no one's going to get anything but reform. Mm -hmm. Sorry to burst anyone's bubble. <laughs> You don't want to storm the barricades with your other black friends? No, I mean, listen, I'm not one of these people who's afraid of revolution, but revolution is something that has to be calculated and has to be created with a specific time and space in which the opportunity is available. Just talking Does it always have to be violent? I don't think it always has to be violent, but sometimes it, can, it might be. The different but, beyond, types. but beyond any of those questions, like, you know, it's just this. It's like. First of all, would I prefer there to just be a socialist party and not have to waste any time with any of this stuff? Yes. But to have that, you have to have a class, right? And like the problem right now is like the class in the United States is disorganized. And this is why this moment is so disappointing because you're seeing militancy in the union movement. You're seeing them take it up to this point that the United States Congress is getting involved. And then what was our role in that moment? That's disappointing to think of the role that that this movement played in that moment, if you get what I mean. Rank and file members of the DSA are pissed. So it's not a question of spirit or will on those. It's organizational, mm -hmm. structural, political strategy things that got us to this moment. And it's just it's really devastating because the moment where you're seeing militancy, you know, we should be the first ones there providing support, growing that, cultivating that. And we had this moment in front of us and we just straight up didn't have the capacity. We didn't have the capacity to do something. And that's that's what makes me so blue right now, if I'm being honest. So with that being said, I mean, how do you feel about the fact that there is so many labor strikes over the past few years, most of them being wildcat strikes and most of them not getting a lot of coverage outside of things like Starbucks workers unions, which I think is a little overreported. Um, we really don't hear about other labor movements and, and strikes and the fact that we depend so much on the rail and I think a lot of people don't understand that and maybe I mentioned it mm -hmm. too flippantly at the end of that that little uh, explanation but the majority of things that we really need in this country is transported by rail mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so if these people all decide to go on strike it's not like you can just hire a bunch of scabs tomorrow and and they're going to operate this level of machinery and i am uh, i have rail workers in the family um as well you know that's a that's a rough job um so do we think they're just going to go on strike i mean i feel like that's their call i don't know i mean i, I support them 100 percent. that's yeah, their call if they want to take that risk because at this point it means that they can crush it with every power that they have in the book. I'm not saying they don't have power, you know, the, the union workers don't have a lot of power too, but you know, that's a, that's a difficult position to be put in. And I, and I want to, and I want to ask this question um, to everybody here as well. Is this reminiscent? I've seen some people trying to make the comparison. Do you guys think this is reminiscent to 
Reagan's first big move when he gets in the office, which is literally crushing the air traffic controllers union. I don't think I, at this particular stage the Democratic Party can afford to take the posture towards labor that Ronald Reagan took in the 1980s. But do you think this is similar to that? I think that the political winds were in favor of Reagan at the time. So him actually putting a shiv in the union movement didn't cost him politically because of the flank of capital that he represented. So I don't think that the metal, that the analogy works. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden represents the left flank of capital, even though the corporate faction of the left flank of capital, and they, even though it is the corporate faction, they have to at least pay lip service to concern about labor to maintain the fealty of the of the masses that dump their money into that party every four years or two years. But it, well, and that includes union leadership as well. Well, the thing is that I don't understand why workers are upset, though, about this, because like both Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden were talking about how hard it is for them and how much it hurts their heart to have to do this, <laughs> which I think was the most disgusting thing about all of this is when Biden is like, I want to be the most pro-labor president. So this is making it really hard for me to do this. It's like, fuck you, man. <laughs> I just want to have it both ways. I just like, they're so not Reagan. Wasn't saying that, right? <laughs> no. And I've never seen Biden as a real pro labor guy. No, I mean, certainly. Biden's just supposed to be like the rail guy, right? He's but you know, the irony is in 92, he voted against a similar action. I wasn't, if I was, if I was alive, I was in diapers, but um, you know, the irony is that as a senator, he, he argued against this power of Congress, specifically on preventing a rail strike, which is, you know, not surprising to see somebody like Biden, who's always been very uh, cheap uh, to buy his interests. But um, it is a sort of interesting little uh, crinkle in the story. Matt? I mean, I don't have really anything more to say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, th there's there's multiple uh, workers strikes right now. And another thing people have to keep into consideration with the December 9th rail strike, it is the Christmas season. Well, I think it was, we had Jonah Furman on MR. I think that that stuff has already been delivered. Yeah, um, the stuff that's really uh, going to be delayed is like, uh, agricultural stuff for next mm -hmm. year. Fertilizer. Fertilizer, the oil, or some other stuff. There's something else that they ship. No, but like, the media was certainly playing up the Christmas angle for sure. But um, oh, yeah. the logistic yeah. facts are is like that shit's in a warehouse ready to be put on a truck. It's not waiting to go across the country on a rail. So, Capitalism is yeah, very good at distributing some of these things sometimes. You know what but, I mean? but, but again, <laughs> back to the whole, are we going to see solidarity strikes? So what yeah. then happens if the Teamsters say, well... We got our brother's backs. I mean, that'd be huge. And that'd be if I UPS. Would 100%. If UPS wants to flex their negotiation muscle, and I don't know if that would be positive or negative for them. We actually had one of the Teamsters on uh, last week, and they're looking at possibly striking with a new contract coming up. What then happens if UPS flexes their muscle and says, well, you need us and we're going to we're going to sit this one out. Meaning, like we're gonna we're gonna have our workers sit down for or slow down or. I mean, be ma I mean, be massive. I mean, the thing is, like, if this does, if a wildcat strike does happen with the with the rails, and then you start to see, you know, trickle down. I mean, this would be this would be a massive historic labor uh, uprising, something that we haven't seen in this country in a long time. We'll see. I think we'll have more information over the next couple of days as to like what the posture is going to be. Um, I, I feel like it's hard to predict from the outside. How people are are feeling internally about this, but I would I support them one hundred percent, and I don't think it'd be unreasonable. Um, yeah, I mean, but, I see a lot of people pissed, but you don't know if that's just you know the tweets you're saying. Yeah, well, people keep saying that's a that's a violation of Taft. Like, yeah, we all know, and this would be a wildcat strike if, if yeah. the we go on strike. So these are all these are all violations of Taft Hartley. We're talking about at this point. So I think people are willing to go all the way. Um, what, what did they get it down to? Six. Or seven six days of paid leave is that what it was what do you mean the vote the vote yeah. yeah well they proposed seven days but that failed but and, they, and it's just the one Senate. yeah i believe so um so yeah it's uh it's it's not good um 
at all. I mean, nothing close. And like, that's the thing too, just like really quick. It's like, this is what the, you know, I do think it's really important to remember that like, we also are just talking about people losing their rights here. Um, but on the paid leave thing, the way the system works and, you know, uh, Max Alvarez at The Real News and Mel Bure um, have been covering this for a long time. People should be reading their stuff if they haven't, because they've been on this um, for months, years. Um, but, you know, the reason that this why is it that, you know, capital is so afraid of paid sick leave? I mean, they're approving, you know, wage increases, right? Um, there's one thing to note about the wage increases. Like these people haven't got a wage increase in years. This has been an ongoing contract dispute. So when you hear 24% wage increase, that that's if you factor in three years of negotiations on it, it starts to become a lot smaller. Um, but on top of that, why are they so worried about the sick leave? It's because the system is set up to basically treat human beings as machines. The, mm -hmm. the modern day rail system that we have in the United States, has been something that's been going on since the rail system has consolidated over the past couple of decades. Since you've got more and more financial capital, shout out to everyone's favorite billionaire, uh, Warren Buffett, um, playing a big role there, um, that they're trying to, um, they're, they've lowered the amount of people who are working on the trains. And that's why you have those mile long trains. If you've ever been stuck behind one of them. Um, that's the development of this system that is basically like a kind of just in time rail system. So there's no wiggle room in the scheduling, which is why they want to force people to go to work if they're sick. That's why they want you not to go to the doctor to check out a lump that you find <laughs> on your neck, right? I mean, literally there's been workers who have died, um, because they had medical appointments. They didn't go to them because they couldn't get time off for sick leave. Um, and the reason that they're so they're so willing to even cut into their profits in the sense of paying higher wages is because the entire system that they've set up right now is set up on this idea that you just have this constant, very slim and smaller um, amount of, of, of rail workers that they can't be um, replaced, that you can't have any kind of shuffling. And that's why they're holding on to this so um, tightly is because their entire business model is designed on hyper, hyper exploitation. There's no wiggle room available. And that's why um, these these workers want paid sick leave. And that's why, you know, at a certain point, it doesn't matter how much the wage increases are if you don't have the ability to be home and see your family. Right. Because that's another thing. People are effectively on call seven days a week, 24 um, seven. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, like it doesn't matter how much you're going to put in my bank account. If I can't see my kids, if I can't be at home on Saturday, if I can't have a couple of beers because I'm worried that I'm going to get you know, called in to like run a train system, right? Um, it's it's a low quality of life that's been created by the system and that's why they're holding onto it so so tightly. Well, uh, there's another labor dispute going on and it's the biggest in the country and it has to do with the UC system. I just want to address uh, someone asked Pascal to define revolution and we won't have pascal define revolution i will say sir please watch our show we just did last saturday with steve paxton where he discusses in his new book um how capitalism ends marx's definition of revolution um which is kind of sort of all our definition if you really think pascal is going to storm the barricades with you with his walmart shotgun um and chewbacca bullet belt um that is not what he has planned on doing or at least not what he told me in the tir memo but to uh help us uh get into the weeds about what's going on in the uc system is a friend of show he's a professor at uc riverside uh he wrote a book that we covered was it two years ago now pascal pretty much white reconstruction please welcome coming all the way live from somewhere in the outer regions of california <laughs> <laughs> professor dylan rodriguez <laughs> <laughs> what's up I, I thought i'd been banned from the show you haven't invited me in a long time uh, it's because I have all this beef with these Filipino baby mamas, and there was a oh, no. Come on, no man, you Filipino gotta. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm an East Coast Filipino, so there was, it was a no Filipino. Well, by the way, what's with the laugh track? Do you have to use the laugh track? Are you doing it? Like, are you doing it in a facetious, sarcastic, ironic way? I'm doing it because I'm fucking funny. We coming for you, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
And sometimes, yes, it is facetious. You never, you never know what's coming, Dylan. You never know what's coming. Oh, you, you the never. Left. What's up, Pascal? What's up, Matt? What's up, Dave? How's what's it going? going on, Dylan? How are you doing, man? I, I'm all right, actually. This, the, the, I've been on the picket line every day supporting the strike, and um, it's uh, it's deeply educational. It's it's inspiring in in many ways. In other ways, it's demonstrating just how evil this beast is. Mm-hmm. Right, which is which is in a way it's also inspiring because it inspires me toward feelings of revenge and vindication and insurgency. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, keeps me alive. But um, but yeah, this thing is real. This thing is real, and the UC UC administration is fucking it all up. And I know not one of them is listening to the show, but maybe the word will get back to them. But I've been saying it ever since I was basically you- here. I- I'm so constantly surprised on who listens to the show and who does not. All right, well, fuck you, UC administration. <laughs> wow. Fuck you. No, fuck, fuck all of you. The way that you disrespect these, 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 these student workers, the most vulnerable people in your system, the ones who spend more time with gra- with undergrad students in like five days than most of y'all spend with them in a year. Fuck mm. you for disrespecting them. Fuck you for being callous about their conditions of work, labor, and life. Fuck you well, all the way. Okay, so I have I have I have some some words I prepared. And I want to get prepared your... those words. What are you trying to say? I prepared those words. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted I wanted to get your take on this, Dylan, because you live uh in you know when we're about the UC system, I think it's it's a right it's a wide ranging system, right? It stretches throughout California and the cost of living throughout California varies drastically. But I think we can all agree it's expensive. There's a reason why I live in Mexico. And I always say this is not because I like surf and tacos, it's because I can't afford my yeah. home state of California. And I didn't realize how much housing the UC system owns throughout the state and how and also how large of an employer. It's, it's uh, what, it, that's what it means to be a land grant institution. It's it's the picture, paradigmatic land grant institution, which means it is a settler colonial, you know, um, mm. paragon, as, as as we might say, right? Like it occupies territory like there's no end, and they've gotten to the point, Jason, where um, I've literally heard administrators do a PowerPoint about gentrifying, right? About gentrifying the surrounding um, blocks. Of, of what's left of, of, of somewhat affordable housing. And mm-hmm. they actually refer to it as sustainability. Mm. Well, that's <laughs> well, I was I mean, this, this, this echoes your, your, your previous conversation just now, right? Like about yeah. so-called overpopulation and how yeah. it's really, I mean, that shit's grounded in eugenics and genocide and all the rest yeah. of that. But I mean, that's that's what they do. Now, it's, it's funny you bring that up, Dylan, because weeks ago when we were talking about what was going on in LA City Council, um, a friend of mine that worked inside was giving me some inside scoops on kind of what to look out for and the player that USC was in a lot of those meetings because USC is trying to become a tr- like an ivy of the west mm. but their big problem is recruiting teachers because it's just so expensive to live there so for them it was gentrifying a neighborhood so that's why you saw people in different political kind of caucuses fighting over who was going to control the district where USC was going to have this expansion on housing. And USC's role in the whole thing kind of got silenced um, in a lot of the reporting. And I think because people were chasing the race story, because that's a hotter story, right? Nuri Martinez calls somebody's kid a monkey and there go all Mexicans are, you know, hate black people. Um, but I, I think that the housing aspect and the fact that, you know, these schools own so much property and have the ability to literally come in and gentrify areas for their yeah. own benefit is extremely underreported. And when you have these teachers striking for higher wages to be able to afford to live where they work. It's insanity to say, well, we're going to raise your rents. And I didn't realize that that's what a lot of these UCs were doing in a lot of these areas. They were literally raising rents. 
No, what they're what they're what they've been in the process of doing for I'd say the last um, pr pretty much since I started my job. I started my job in two thousand one, so this is year twenty two for me. So mm -hmm. I know these sick fuckers. Like I know them really well. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 for y'all um, that I just met, I, I served two terms as the academic senate chair for Riverside. Right. So I was in rooms with chancellors, with the UC president, UC system president, meaning Janet Napolitano, former head of Homeland Security, top cop, um, all the rest of them. So I, I'm, I'm deeply familiar with their thinking, with their paradigms, with their what passes as their kind of logic um, and their rationales. I'm also very familiar with the selective dysfunction that they have normalized within certain parts of the UC system, particularly places um like like riverside like santa cruz um, um to mm -hmm. some extent even place place like santa barbara etc mm -hmm. um where housing insecurity health insecurity food insecurity as well as just baseline economic insecurity meaning meaning people living significantly below that fake ass thing that we call the poverty line mm -hmm. right like we have to refer to it as the fake ass thing we call the poverty line because the poverty line as it's defined is bullshit anyways Right. So I'm saying like there's people who are living well below the poverty line in all these places. So part of the project of the UC system um, over the last 20, 20, 25 years has been to normalize that. Right. To, to turn it into a non crisis. And, and what's happening with the strike right now is that the attempt to normalize has essentially ratted itself out to the point where to go, come back to that word. It is it is in the most materialist sense of the sense of the term. It is deeply unsustainable. Mm. Right. You have people that are being hospitalized. People um, people have killed themselves. Um, people mm. have, you know, people. have. But here's what they count on. Here's what they count on. Me and the administration, they count on just attrition. Right. The, the, these hyper exploited workers, meaning the people who do the majority of the teaching and grading in the system, who are basically um, under a weird kind of apprentice type system where they're exploited, underpaid, and mm. there's no promise of anything on the other end, right? The assumption is that half or more of them are just gonna leave. I mean, that they're just they're gonna either just get disaffected and 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 go find another job. They will um, not be able to complete their dissertation thesis and therefore they'll drop out of programs. They're cool with that. They're cool with that. The, the first encounter I had with a high administrator at Riverside was when I was chairing the Ethnic Studies Department in 2009. Um, and dude comes in, his name uh, Dallas Rabenstein, right? Uh, by the way, inside inside thing, I just learned many people in his college refer to him as Darth Rabenstein. Peace to you, Dallas. <laughs> so Dallas, and I, so I'm, by the way, I'm too old. Um, I'm a senior faculty. If they want to come get me, they can come get me. So I'm like, say that's why I'm just saying names at this point. Jason, Pascal, mm -hmm. Dave, Matt, mm -hmm. like the names need to be just old <laughs> at this point. Um, so Dallas came in and me being the naive want to be, you know, advocate chair for ethnic studies grad students that were incoming. I was I was telling Dallas on behalf of the department, you know, the packages, the financial aid packages you're giving, the fellowship financial aid teaching packages you're giving these grad students are way below standard. We're going to have trouble recruiting people. We're going to have trouble keeping people through to see them to the end of their degree, which is our responsibility, right? That's our responsibility. And um, and and Darth just looked at me with his dead ass, dead blue eyes. You know how it is, right? The dead blue eyes. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, well, you know, nationally, it's about a little over a 50% attrition rate for graduate students. And then he just stopped uh, yeah. and just gave wow. me the dead look. He just gave me the dead look. And that, that shook me. I got to admit, Darth shook me when he said that. Um, because it did not, it did like, it, it hadn't dawned on me to that point that this is, this is, this is actually how they work. Hmm. Right. It, it's a, uh, it's where they, you know, you know, it's, it's like the, the, uh, the insurance folks, right. When they like, like in fight club and whatnot, when they, when they, when they calculate, okay, if we, mm -hmm. if we tweak the policy this way, mm -hmm. we'll get this many lawsuits and this many people will prematurely unnecessarily die, but our bottom line will benefit this much. It's that there's a calculus to it. It's a brutal calculus. Uh, and and that's what they're dealing with now. The way that they fucked up, though, is is the UC administration um, underestimated number one the seriousness of the strikers. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Mark Owen. Actuarials, right? Yeah, that's their actuarials. It's a brutal actuarial. Um, but 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 what they what they underestimated was how serious the strike was. Secondly, they underestimated how there would be at least a moment where the grievances articulated by the strike sees the kind of moral, ethical, and narrative high ground. Mm. Right. And 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 thirdly, um, they weren't ready to deal with 
just the empirical fact that it's the largest strike of university or so-called academic workers in the history of the, of the United States. Like they just, they, they weren't, I don't think they were ready for that. Um, so they think they're just going to see it. They think that they think they're just going to ride it out through, through attrition, but, um, there's no, there's no real end in sight to the full strike. The, the postdoc and, and, um, researchers got a decent contract a few days ago, but the rest of the body of the 50,000 or so people that are striking their contracts, I think are nowhere close to being satisfactory. So like there, there's like a tremendous amount of, of solidarity. Cause like one of the things that's so like wild about like university stuff in the country right now is that like, you know, like. There's like the old Marxist idea of like the intelligentsia, right? It's its own class because like they're sort of pulled out of production in this like nice way and they're shielded from it. But all we've seen in my lifetime is just like the proletarianization of like the university, right? Like these people, you know, these 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 workers are much closer to the poverty yeah. line um, yeah. than you would ever expect, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And you can't imagine, um, and I'm just curious what you think about this, that like that doesn't create a lot of solidarity um, I'm certainly like people are sort of at the top, top of the university structure right. of professors sometimes can be a little bit traitors, but you know, it doesn't take long to see, oh man, the bottom is getting lower and lower and lower and lower before people realize it's coming for me too very soon. If I don't stand up, uh, you know, with my brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's so much worse than you think it is, Dave. Um, it's so much worse than that because not only is the bulk of the instructional labor Pro, it's been proletarianized, right? We're, we're, we're on our way to the system, essentially eliminating so-called ladder rank faculty, certainly getting rid of tenure. The concept of tenure will be obsolete by the time, hmm. probably by the time I'm 60 and I'm, I'm 49. I'm not 50, Jason. I'm 49. <laughs> Don't call me 50. <laughs> by the time I'm 60, I'm pretty sure tenure will be gone. Um, they will obsolete tenure. So the proletarianization of the instruction will be there. I think the whole this is a thing that gets talked about all the time, but it doesn't translate into um, an effective popular messaging. The, the research mission of universities, what differentiates universities from colleges, right, is, is there supposed to be a research mission. People are supposed to be, you know, kind of innovating and thinking and doing shit. That's that's ebbing away. That's going to get privatized. That, that'll just be that'll be think tanks, you know, what I mean, and foundations and, um, you know, that'll, that'll get nonprofitized over there. So university, the university research mission is being obsolete as we speak. You, all you have to do is walk into a UC Riverside, you know, laboratory or pick a random classroom and, and you'll be able to see that both of those things have been have been rotting from the start. But the other thing that you mentioned, which is the ladder rank faculty, meaning those who are on the tenure tenure track, um, for the most part, they their work is also being proletarianized mm. in the sense that there's a gutting of staff capacity. Right. Staff capacity has been gutted. So what staff, the staff that are left are overworked um, beyond comprehension, right? Student advisors with several hundred students to advise. So there's no advising that's actually happening. It's really hard to actually advise students. We have 300 plus of them. And, and, and not to mention the fact that a bunch of the, the kind of everyday work that used to have paid staff, um, you know, focus on things like reimbursements, right? Travel expenses, you know, conference organizing, event organizing, whatnot. That's 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 been shifted over, um, somewhat gradually, but also somewhat quickly to the ladder rank faculty themselves. So, like, I I spent probably twelve hours this past this past quarter, the mm -hmm. fall quarter, doing my own travel reimbursements on some online system that doesn't make any fucking sense, right? I keep fucking it up, and they keep sending it back and saying you fucked it up. Do it again. Right. So I keep getting F's on my travel reimbursements. Right. But like, that's my job now that actually became part of my routine. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, pro, the, but here's the problem is that as much as the ladder rank faculty, including tenured faculty complain about the gutting of the staff, most of my colleagues still continue to identify with management and as mm -hmm. management. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And what we got now is we're in, we're on the cusp of a grade strike, which is one of the few leverage points that instructors have to really create a crisis in the university to stop production, right? You mm -hmm. stop production, you do a grade strike. Um, and to just see the pearl, the liberal pearl clutching that happens among, I'm talking about people who have nothing at stake, people who have no risks that, that are really worth talking about, meaning like senior tenured faculty, the pearl clutching that they engage in to make excuses to not participate in a grade strike in solidarity with, with student teachers who are, you know, living six people to a two bedroom apartment. Why not? It's, it is, it's embarrassing. It's reprehensible. Um, um, and, and, you know, and I think, I think history will not look kindly on them. Um, Pascal, do you want to add something? Yeah. 
all of the things that you're talking about contextually in terms of what's going on with schools, I've heard friends of mine who are in academia referred to as the neoliberalization of u- the university system in America. I don't know if you're opposed to that term because a lot of people find neoliberalism as an otherizing kind of term for just a normal functionality of capitalism at this yeah. stage. Do you think that private private and state universities are engaging in almost kind of the normative function of capitalism? In other words, was this something that was planned or is this something that came about as a result of certain crises that were endemic to the school systems in themselves? I think I think in a way it's it, it's sort of all the above. But what's really happening, as you see at places like North Carolina, university, sorry, University of North Carolina, public institution, right? Mm-hmm. University of Michigan, large public institution. It's that we go down the line, right? Mm-hmm. University of California in particular mm-hmm. um, is, is, is that nominally public universities have essentially taken the route of becoming private universities, right? So they become public in name only in the sense that um, for the, so, the, the, the de facto flagship schools in the UC system, Berkeley, UCLA in particular, they essentially can run on private money. They can run mm-hmm. on an endowment, right? They don't rely on state money whatsoever, which is why Riverside is always in a position of extreme scarcity and vulnerability because Riverside does not have a large endowment. We don't have tons of rich alumni, right? So we actually are, in a sense, a traditional public university that relies on state money. But but that's where the state comes in, right? When the state decides it's going to eviscerate um, K through 12 in public education, higher education um, included, especially in states like California, um, and, and and therefore reallocate its capacity, you know, tax base and, and, and so forth elsewhere, um, it these things are all going hand in hand. It's all happening at the same time. So so in a sense, it's 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 both it's both part of a logical unfolding of capitalism whether you want to call it neoliberalism or not i really don't care right i have no attachment to any of those terms well it's it's part it's part of just the unfolding of capitalism as something that constitutes the myth of the public university right Mm -hmm. it's always been a myth but like let's let's be real right it's not a coincidence that that the privatization of a public university has been happening at the very same time um that you have you know relatively larger numbers of so-called first generation students undocumented students black students brown students etc finding ways to access those those spaces right and it's not a coincidence that, that at the same time that's happening student debt has turned into you know a historical crisis right to the point that you have organizations like the debt collective talking about organizing around you know collectivizing debt and turning it against the debt the debtors you know and, and at the very same time you have this the people who run the state legislatures who um really don't hold these universities um in in any kind of high esteem they, they're not really high highly prioritized i know the california state legislature sees the uc system as a bunch of spoiled brats it, see, it sees the uc as a decadent um undertaking it looks very kindly on the cal state university system because in their minds I mean the legislature in their minds the cal state university system produces tons of undergraduate degrees which is all they really care about because it's it's butts and seats and it's and it's, and it's fees Right, and it's service to the state of California, right? So, but but what it comes down to is that the leadership of the UC system, meaning those administrators that I was cursing out earlier, they've done a shitty job trying to communicate and convince anybody that the UC system is worth in it, uh, the state's investment. I so, really appreciate, would, appreciate, would no, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jason, but I just want to say I really appreciate the way you framed that in talking about how the the space of the public university is being privatized because that's really kind of one of the em- emblematic natures of neoliberalization is the kind of gutting of the public function of spaces and the removal of the commons and the surrendering of them to the private thoroughfares of corporatism. It's really, really well said on your part. Yeah, I mean, well, I appreciate that you're saying that, but, but you know, the commons has always been for white people. It's always been for a white middle class and a white upwardly mobile class. And, and um, by the way, do y'all ever talk about racial capitalism on this show? Pascal exactly. got into it with all right, Pat, okay. NFL because okay, I need I need to go I need to go review that because I think I think racial capitalism all the time. So maybe I'm in a little bit of tension, but not necessarily antagonism, but tension with some of the ways that we're understanding capitalism here. But I understand this as a logical as a logical um as part of the logical, you know, process and 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 um metastasization of racial capitalism at that particular geography, this, the geography of the public university. Um that's how I see it. I think racial capitalism is working itself out, meaning that, meaning that the translation of, of a multi-dimensional, um, 
multifaceted and, and and not necessarily militarized but but no less direct domestic war asymmetrical domestic war to pacify and domesticate um in potentially insurgent populations um populations that would otherwise at least fuck the system up if not actually try to win liberation um and or stoke whatever we want to think about as revolution that 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 the impulse to repress and domesticate and pacify and commodify incorporate and assimilate those populations is playing itself out in real time in the uc system right um, um you see it at riverside places like riverside in particular which the uc public relations machine loves uh to turn into photo ops they love to talk about the diversity um profile of of of, of, of the university of california by way of places like uc riverside which has a ton of so-called first generation students mm -hmm. but as soon as you start talking about uh the fact that this diversity profile means that you need to translate um that profile into the infrastructure of the university I mean you have to rethink it everything from its budgetary priorities to its curriculum that's where shit stops and they start waging war right and that's what we're seeing play out in real time here if you go on the picket line um at, at my at the campus that I, that I that i work at if you go to that picket line you see it play out right because it's it's a black brown queer disabled there's a whole political education on disability today on the picket line mm -hmm. right and, and 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 international students meaning international students from from global south non-wealthy so-called what we used to call third world countries right so people not from wealth right that that's who's on the picket line those are the grad students on the picket line so these are folks that are right now relying on um emergency strike pay to pay bills right so they they have everything at stake in the strike right which is which is why i have no um patience for administrators who are acting like this is nothing and who are also just they're directing people to like call the cops on the strikers for being too loud well there's also a few in the, you so you were featured in an la times article uh i wouldn't days. say featured jason i was quoted you they featured they featured they they featured those sellout scabs from berkeley that's who they featured i was gonna so i was gonna mention your uc colleagues your uc colleagues i was gonna mention your uc colleagues uh that were saying that look at joe biden just grinning at pascal uh i was gonna <laughs> mention your uc colleagues that that um said that well you know a lot of this talk about the pay these people are getting is bullshit. they're not getting twenty four thousand dollars. some are getting 48 which isn't a lot of money. That was, I would say, let, let's let's do the golf clap for the. Yeah, that's out. that's not. You can't. It, you can't live in Santa Cruz on that. You definitely ain't living in Berkeley on that. You can you even get by on that in Riverside? No. It, no. Yeah. No, it's a joke. This whole this whole thing. It's it, the whole thing's absurd. The whole thing's absurd. I I think, um, what what I would what I would like to do is as a thought experiment right Let, let's imagine so we so so the crisis of this instructional labor withdrawing right from the production machine of the university is playing out now so we know that it has consequences right all layers and layers of consequences for this form of labor to to withhold what it does right people are fucking freaking out already now as a thought experiment what would happen if you had i'd say maybe 75 to 80 percent of administrators disappear would we miss them <laughs> probably not right now i'm not advocating wiping them off the planet but i am saying if they somehow just disappeared i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure that the mission of the university would actually be fulfilled possibly better do, do you do you have any sense not to put you on the spot but do you have any sense about how much of the tuition goes which way because my friend's up at the new school now, and they're participating in the strikes up there. And he was sending me the statistics on how much of tuition money goes to the administration versus, you know, uh, in oh, instruction. Yeah. And it just it blew my mind, uh, really, when you when you see stuff like that. I mean, the the, the one the ones who've been doing that work, Chris Newfield's got a whole book on this. Um, mm -hmm. um, my, my friend Nick Mitchell, who's Santa Cruz, is finishing a book on this. But um, I mean, the the problem is that number one, they don't call it tuition. Mm. Right, because to call it tuition would mean that they were in violation of, you know, the founding documents of the UC system, right? So they call them fees. Mm -hmm. So like that's the premise we have to actually start with, right? Is that is that the premise of the UC system is that it's supposed to be a truly public education, which anybody can access 
and, and people are were supposed to be entitled to access. It's not supposed to be a privilege. It's supposed to be an entitlement, right? Again, for white people, but, you know, bracketing that in the founding constitutional documents of the UC system, it says there will be no tuition. So what do they do? They do that evil bastard shit and they call it fees, right? So, so I mean, within within one generation, those fees have multiplied astronomically um, um, to, the, to the point where I think the fees are primarily paying for building expansion and administrative salaries, right? I mean, faculty salaries still constitute like the bulk of, of the budget, right? But they should, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is this is the point, right? Is sometimes you go back and forth with high administrators. Well, you know, the budget still majority. It's you know, when we were arguing with them about the police budget, right? We, we, were, we were cops off campus, the statewide cops off campus movement, right? We were making an argument to, you know, to significantly downsize if not eliminate the police apparatus in the uc system right and we had a whole analysis we had a whole alternative budget and whatnot um and and so we went back and forth with them on the budget and one of the kind of you know straw people things they would march out every now and then is, well you know the the, the the police budget is still minuscule compared to the faculty budget as if as if we should be comparing <laughs> those two things mm -hmm. right right so uh yeah so so i think i think what you see is that the administrative the, the administrative capacity uh, has has actually expanded over time, which means the budget expanded over time. Um, and what they do is they manage. Right. That's all they do. They, they and I've been in the rooms with them. They, they're engaged in management. And I'll tell you what kind of management they do. This is the, a quick anecdote that'll tell you where shit is coming from. This was around June 2020. So we're at the height of pandemic time. Right. This is like when everything is still basically unknown. People are just dying left and right. And and stuff's just really fucked up. And um, one of the tensions was that you had basically like kind of UC Riverside administrator Ron DeSantis wannabes that, that were trying to figure out how to force people to meet in person. Right. And there's, oh, well, we're going to plan it this way and we'll we'll people will wear masks and we'll put plastic shields up and whatnot. And I remember a colleague of mine um, asked the associate provost, this dude named Ken Barenclaw, and I still don't understand why he's there. And I still don't understand what he does other than that. He does the work of the provost when when they don't want to do it. But somebody asked him, have you, the administration at Riverside, have you thought about how many people need to die before you rethink your in-person policy? Right. And, mm -hmm. and do just kind of like look down at his blank piece of paper and said, you know, we haven't thought about that yet. Damn. Doing the math. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, 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 so somebody, I mean, my friend, my friend in the chat was talking about actuarials, like, there's actually there's people who do actuarials and then there's like the terror of those who don't even bother right they don't even bother we had a librarian die during the pandemic and nobody knew about it except by word of mouth because because you know there was there definitely wasn't going to be any kind of formal administrative messaging about that you know because it would have been an i told you so moment right over somebody Damn. over somebody's grave right so we're talking about that level of of just of just of just callousness and um and, and fucking evil so it sounds to me like the school system is just corporate America. But Jason, you're, 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 you're giving them too much credit, my friend. You're giving them too much credit, right? Like, like here's, I was talking about this earlier today with somebody. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. These motherfuckers, mm -hmm. they want to think about themselves as emulating corporate America, but they're still in a university higher education setting. So they want to think about themselves as like these liberal enlightened leaders, at the very same time, right? So they can't even do corporate shit right. Me, by which I mean they, they don't even have it, they don't even have the spine to get as brutal and terrorizing as corporate leaders do. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Because they want they still want to live up to some kind of, you know. Well, you still you also. still have a lot of that like you know, academic leadership on top. It hasn't gone the way of like, you know, most corporations where there's just some guy from the finance industry that's on top. What then happens though? when you see leadership or just college leadership i you know i can't speak for every university in america starts to look like these boards at other major corporations what happens when uh the but, but what i'm saying what, no but what i'm saying to you is that it, it it already looks like that like it already mm -hmm. resembles that right it's just that the people are are not um they're not they're not they don't have the will or the know-how to actually execute in the ways that corporate the ways that corporate managers and administrators do because they are fucking ruthless like they will actually kill you like they'll directly kill you
<laughs> these fuckers will kill you with their dysfunction, right? <laughs> and then and then and then with their neglect and with their you know what I mean and with their dimwittedness. But but I've seen so many times that higher education administrators in the UC system they they don't even have a good calculus of what their own self interest is, right? So I've had these weird moments when I when I was working as senate chair where I was having to tell them, mm-hmm. right? You know I'm helping you here. It is in your interest to listen to what I'm saying, and here's why, right? And they, the shit would go right through them, right? And again, this is, I think, part of part of how racial capitalism plays into this. Like, there's a kind of irrationality, a kind of war that's built into the the the, the, the kind of conditions of possibility um, for things like capitalism to form and its institutions to form, you know. And so that's that's what I'm in hindsight. That's what I think was playing out in part. Right. Was that was that I was making some kind of weird, like humanist argument about what their self-interest should be. And they were like, nah, that doesn't make sense to us. Right. We're about neutralizing, domesticating and pacifying, as well as all this other neoliberal shit. So Gene Bajlan is here and he is a fellow professor with you. What's up? He is at Missouri State University um, and he has been uh, right oning you in the chat the whole time. If you don't know, Dylan, Gene uh, is works on the show as well. Um, and I don't think Gene was around when you, uh, when you were coming on the show a, a lot more regularly um, before the Filipino ban. <laughs> are we talking about the Filipino ban in public now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I just had to jump on because this is all very very true uh in the uh, you know what what dylan's talking about is really this degrading of public education and what a public institution is supposed to do you know if you go back into the past and look at education more generally Mm -hmm. you know you know obviously it was problematic a lot of education was directed towards nation building building a civic identity which of course you know has problems with it but it was not uh, orientated towards serving business, right? And that's really what a lot of these institutions are trying to change their philosophy towards is that we serve the chamber of commerce. We, you know, in the past, people would get an education, but they'd learn their job on the job. Uh, An education, at least the philosophy behind the American education system, which combines British teaching institutions with the German style of research institution, you know, the, the, the idea was to have this like rounded education. That's why you have these uh, general education requirements, why you're supposed to take a number of different uh, courses, et cetera, et cetera. But now, you know, the philosophy is like, if the degree isn't making money, if it's uh, if it isn't serving very directly a business interest, then it's kind of worthless. And you know, this combined with the degradation of public education means that, you know, kids coming into university are just not equipped at times to deal with the type of work that's go, uh, that they have to do at u- university. So universities kind of are like overwhelmed. There aren't the resources to help them. And when it comes to the graduate students, I mean, the, the, the talk about the proletarianization of education, you know, a lot of universities establish PhD programs, graduate programs, in order to have graduate students to do the work, because it's a lot cheaper to have a graduate student getting paid, what, $25,000, $30,000 a year, who does all the marking and, uh, you know, does a lot of the grunt work of teaching these lower level courses than having a a research trained faculty, a ladder ranked faculty do that. So you have, you know, contingent faculty, obviously, uh, it's uh, in, in certain disciplines, it's a kind of buyer's market. So you have people, you know, desperate to get experience. And then you have all these graduate students who are put into PhD programs, do all the work, and then there's no jobs for them when they come out because all the ladder rank faculty positions are being gotten rid of. So, uh, and the reason some of these senior faculty sign on for it is because it's, it's not just the administration who likes this, but it's also some senior faculty like to have these uh graduate students who end up doing their jobs for them you know so that they can do the important work of research as opposed to doing teaching so we have you know like we have some serious structural problems and you know dylan was 100 percent correct in, in, in his assessment like 
these people, a lot of these people in management, they aren't exactly totally corporate America, but they wish to emulate corporate America. But at the same time, they have the, all this kind of education speech and uh, that they use to justify all kinds of ways to cut costs or to shift administrative burdens onto ranked faculty to cut, uh, you know, for example, it's like with something like advising, which is a good example. It's like, well, you know, let's not have uh, an advisor advise students. Let's have the faculty advise students so that the faculty can mentor the students, right? You know, trying to work out whether someone needs to take maths 102 is not mentoring, but it's a way to like uh, try and get people to do jobs that previously would have been done by professionals and administrators. And then a lot of the administrative bloat just comes down to all these kind of uh, uh, student life things because universities become it's become like a marketplace where you go to the university and the way that they get you there is like look we have a great swimming pool we have all these like clubs and things like that and, and the focus increasingly moves on to the student life uh stuff as opposed to you know the core which is the faculty who you know technically in many institutions they have faculty government governance but the faculty are so overworked they can't really participate in faculty government governance in any meaningful way and all the decisions are made by uh, appointees and trustees of the university who don't have an academic background. So, you know, it's, it's a, the problem is like, it's not that there isn't the resources there even at times. It's just that the resources that there are get spent on all kinds of ridiculous arbitrage, like purchasing software, which is supposed to make things easier. Like Dylan said, you know, now you, instead of someone help, uh, filling out your, travel reimbursement they've purchased an expensive piece of software which they uh, pay a private company to do and uh, you know you submit things through that so it's there's some really problematic developments taking place in public universities and you know the rich universities get away with you know they're fine because they have their endowments uh, but you know the public universities many of them are trying to compete with these private universities missing the point that ivy league universities aren't people don't go to them for their stellar teaching or their uh, or what have you they go there to make connections right you can be a dumbass that's why that's why matt and david went to harvard yeah Did they... <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the cheers, fuck you, glass. <laughs> Just so the record straight, I did not go to Harvard. <laughs> no, I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't go to NYU. For no, 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 no one here went to Harvard. Our, our, our Harvard man. Is the Harvard here. guy is, isn't here right now, but we do have a Harvard guy. Pascal he didn't go to was University of Berkeley. He went to uh, UC, UC University of California as well. That's well, that's Dylan. That's where you did your grad school at, at UC. I did my grad school at UC Berkeley. Harvard rejected me. Fuck Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. They had their Filipino quota. Apparently. We, so you. So apparently, so yeah, you. Off <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> bye. I'll take over as host with you, Pascal. <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that, Dylan, because I was talking to Jason earlier and he was saying that you had seen. A uh, an honor that I did to the late great yes mentor and friend and friend and teacher of mine, Glenn Man. Ford. I, 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 let's let's uh, let's let Matt and David go because oh. they usually don't stay with us this late. Okay. Uh, they have to go. And now. David, thank you guys for for sticking around this long. Definitely, definitely appreciate. It. Thank you so much, Dylan. I love you guys. I'm I'm so happy to meet both of you. Yeah, yeah, right. good to meet you, Dylan. You guys, right take on. care, y'all. Later. Hey, good peace, luck. Guys. That was Matt and David from Left Reckoning. Now we got an old school TIR night right now. Dylan is actually uh, a big reason why Pascal and I were on the real news because one of his ex students, uh, Cam, Cam Granadino, that's right, works for the real news, and we were yes. able to get that uh, that gig. But Pascal, and, and actually, I hope everyone is enjoying free champagne. <laughs> This is definitely uh, champagne room time. You guys are getting all the free champagne right now. I feel like we should play this. You know what? Just, just should we do this, Gene? 
just so they know what the champagne room is like because these people keep missing out right let's let's show them what the free champagne don't is take like. cancelable champagne room stuff in this segment no 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 i'm gonna do give them this look champagne every night it is a, is it a bud light or a top shelf scotch or other liquor what is their drink selection like champagne every night would you want to sit in a club with a frumpy recluse with a bad attitude So here are the ways to identify a whale. With these elements in place, you create your ultimate signature atmosphere, also known as the champagne room. So now wow. you guys know what it's like when you step into the champagne room. There's a different soundboard, which Pascal's warned me not to use, so we won't be using those triggers as this is a more public episode, and this is also on David and Matt's channel. <laughs> we don't want to get their channel pulled down as well. But Dylan, I want to say once again, thank you. I'm glad we're able to work this out uh, for you to come on and hang out with us. And you Wait, have... are you kicking me off right now? No, I'm, I'm, I'm setting up the, the, the pivot to the next conversation. He's kicking um, me out. So you had mentioned to me, you said, oh, I've watched one of the older episodes. So there was an episode we did when yeah. uh, Glenn Ford passed away. Yeah. Pascal really wanted to do because Pascal yeah. uh, wrote for Black Agenda Report for some time yeah. and, and knew Glenn and, and Bruce personally, actually. And um, I didn't realize <coughs> that I never made that episode public. Usually when we do a Mau Mau episode, it's, hmm. it's interaction for the patron audience and then we make it public. I never made that one public. Gene went in, changed all the thumbnails, made it public again. So it's getting a new life, which I'm really glad. And you wanted to address some things about that episode because you also knew Glenn Ford and you've also written for Black Agenda. I just wanted to, I just wanted to thank Pascal for, for saying Glenn Ford's name and bringing him out because he will never die. That guy will never die. I'm, I'm, my, my, bond, my bond with Glenn started the moment Barack Obama was elected because at the time... <laughs> <laughs> at the time he was, you know, at the time, at the time that a lot of our alleged left friends, colleagues, and comrades were, despite their best selves, celebrating in the streets and in their kitchens over that moment, Glenn, Glenn was one of the few people that was pissed about it, um, as was I, and I think that was our initial bond. And so we had a series of conversations over the years um, in which we recognized how we both found a skill set in life raining on people's <laughs> raining on people's liberal parade <laughs> in, in other words in other words in other words the moments when our friends colleagues comrades who are otherwise on the on 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 some good shit you know the moments where they get seduced into these periods of celebration um which is really domestication uh glenn, glenn glenn wouldn't hesitate he wouldn't hesitate to say what was up he did not care what you thought of him in those moments and so um he'll he'll i'll be living with him as my role model for the rest of my life wow the, will. the big words man yeah well, you know I also came to uh, familiarity with Bruce and Glenn, Bruce Dixon and Glenn Ford, as a result of the rise of Obama, and it's really funny. I had had a relationship with Bruce Dixon via email because I started blogging around 2007, and he had read some of my blog, and I got his email, and we were corresponding, and that was even before I started writing for Black Agenda Report, and he was, and I had been reading Black, uh, reading Black Agenda Report, and I had I written a piece that was published in the black commentator and he had read it and he had liked it. And I also got in contact with Glenn and my first uh, video that I saw, cause I used to watch Glenn's videos. He had some, you know, cause Glenn had that very powerful booming deep voice. He had radio, he had you know, very good radio. Yeah. Voice. And um, my first recollection of Glenn in the video form was watching a video 
where he explained the threat that Barack Obama posed to black politics and why. And he, he made he went very, very good presentation, long presentation. And I was ambivalent about Obama before that anyway, but I was really ambivalent. I thought he was gonna be just another Clinton. But immediately when I watched that video, I was like, no, this guy is kind of like an existential threat in a way that we haven't seen before. And I started to really get a lot closer to both Glenn and Bruce, particularly Bruce. And then I, after, you know, a certain, right around the, the Haiti earthquake, I started to expand my writing. Then I started to write for, uh, I got a piece published in a few places, Huffington Post and so forth. And I started publishing in Black Agenda Report as well. And I started to deal with both Bruce and Glenn. And I always told them that they they both reminded me of my old Haitian uncles who kind of raised me, who were like leftists, but always like, you know, getting into fights and arguments and having drink, you know, drinking, playing cards every weekend and whatnot. And, you know, just kind of like cranky old man shit. <laughs> and but but they were so deep in wisdom and knowledge and history and just the books that they suggested to me to read that I still remember and just the analysis that that Glenn would do and they had their disagreements in terms of worldview they definitely had different ways of looking at things but the extent to which they shaped my understanding of left politics of radical black politics, of black political history, revolutionary black political history, and and just overall writing and analysis, I, I can't I cannot begin to uh, to explain for people to understand, man. So I appreciate you saying those kind of words, for sure, bro. About about the, about, about that Glenn Ford, for sure. You know, I I, I was um, I had the I had the um extraordinary privilege of um for the first time visiting mumia abu jamal in september mm -hmm. uh, and i got to sit with him with a couple of my uc system colleagues um uh to talk to him about his he's you know you know by the way you know you know mumia is in the phd program in history of consciousness at uc santa cruz wow I didn't know yeah. That. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um so a couple of uh, three of us got to sit with him and talk about his dissertation. And and I was thinking of Glenn during that conversation, actually, because we were talking to Mumia about his project. And what we arrived at was the notion of of pugilistic, the, 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 the way he, he thought about was pugilistic, you know, form, yeah, a form of, yeah, a form of thought in writing that is pugilistic. And, and I, you know, I use the term weaponized, but it's basically the same thing. You don't think about one's writing as as um something to be refined to wage guerrilla war absolutely um, and absolutely that's that was, that's, that's what that i saw glenn doing i saw glenn yeah. doing that all the time and and the way the like the way that he was just so unapologetic um about coming for people who are otherwise valorized in certain yeah. sectors of the so-called left was one of the most deeply admirable things that he would do and so i i try i try so hard to be like that because of him and he was willing to pay the price for it man, because he yes. lost a lot glenn ford worked in some amazing jobs in the media and journalism yeah. and really maintained his integrity at the expense of fame and fortune because he was unwilling to sell out and sell his principles and his core values and his core beliefs to maintain that line where he was like yo man these people are public enemy number one and they need to be exposed as being such I'm there. I'm there with them. I'm there with them. Like I'm tired of academics who want to sell people workbooks on how to be an anti-racist, for example. I think that stuff is not only corny, it's not only old, but it's also counterinsurgent. I think it actually undermines like, you know, liberation movements and collective forms of, you know, trying to struggle against anti-blackness and colonialism and, you know, various forms of racial oppression. But I mean, this, this is, this is the thirst that Glenn was unflinching about calling out like he would call yeah. that shit out he said this is this is this is about clout thirst as the young people would call it nowadays right but he would call that out and name it I like he that. would name it i like that clout thirst did you want to add something gene are you clout thirsty i'm so clout thirsty <laughs> <laughs> My is unquenchable <laughs> <laughs> no i think 
they took a brave stand, both Bruce, Bruce Dixon and Glenn Ford, at a time when it was easy to liquidate yourself into the Obama movement. Yep. And the, Obama's election really was a critical, pivotal moment uh, for separating out who was serious and who was not serious. And because of the hegemony Obama had over uh, the black political class, <clears throat> over uh, cultural leaders. I mean, you remember the whole uh, Boondocks episode, Dick riding Obama, you know? Yeah. Dude, I've, I've gone back and watched. I can't find the Boondocks anywhere here in Mexico. There's someone that put a bunch of episodes up on YouTube, but not in any sort of order. And going back and watching old Boondocks episodes is it's like a mirror into now and it's really fucking sad especially that nut ride and obama episode <clears throat> i remember that time vividly it was crazy but it was, man but it was extremely powerful and people who didn't want to get with the program suffered co consequences right there there are certain moments where they will allow you you know where the powers that would be will allow somewhat you know a little bit of radical talk because it's not a threat right this is what i you know what i said the other night you know in university which by and large is uh a functionally a wing of the democratic party the enemy is republicans right they hate republicans they'll tolerate the left until the left doesn't sign on to liberal politics right until they present they're seen as presenting a threat or that they're like critiquing the main they're not critiquing the main enemy they're not critiquing the political right but they're critiquing the democratic party right <clears throat> and that's kind of writ large for uh the liberal wing of american politics they'll allow some kind of radicalism at certain moments right but as soon as it comes to the crunch you know you will be excluded and obama was one of those moments he was you know they they obama successfully challenged channeled the discontent at george w bush the anti-war movement and the aspirations of <clears throat> black people in america <clears throat> to feel integrated into the american political project they channeled all that into barack obama and then when somebody came out from inside quote unquote the community and said this is this is just a politics of containment what you call it pascal right yep. then you know then they were excommunicated they were pushed to the side and they weren't listened to anymore and a lot of people who are now acting like radicals and critical of obama's legacy at the time when obama was in power were quite happy to pull their punches because you know you can get yourself onto morning joe that way right well, you know, remember what happened to cornell west and tavis smiley before tavis had his uh whatever happened i haven't been following his career for some time but i remember him and cornell west came out real hard against obama after kind of being on the obama bandwagon in 08 but in 2012 they really started you know sounding the alarm that this guy was a problem and i feel like what fucking took him so long <laughs> Hope. this was not a surprise pascal mm -hmm. you talked about it the other day didn't you yeah you broke down yeah, the whole genealogy of like they handpicked you know yeah. uh, like these it started this in the 90s it started, started in the 90s it don't give me that shit. don't give me that shit. i love cornell and everything like i met him sweet guy like i respect him so much Right, but it, it shouldn't have fucking took that long, Cornell. I wouldn't trust. My Cornell. bad. I interrupted you. My bad. I'm sorry. I, I would. I wouldn't trust him around my woman. You don't want Cornell around your woman. Anyway, look, Cornell. Once you go Persian, there's no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna play a sound effect, Jason? You gonna play a sound effect? No, my brother. <laughs> no, my brother. <laughs> I 
Look, I kind of get people getting swept up in 2008. I mean, because people, I think people forget how terrible the Bush administration was. Yeah, that's, like, that's what it was. It was so terrible. It was so terrible. 2004 set up 2008 because there were so many motherfuckers. Like when people talk about a left, I wouldn't. And that, there was an anti-Bush movement. I won't call it the left. And the anti-Bush movement, I felt was strong in 2004. I don't know how you guys on the screen feel. Yeah. And when he won again, it was like you could you could hear the pop. And everyone was just waiting for the Obama guy because Obama had spoke at the uh was it the <coughs> DNC? The 2004 DNC con convention where uh, John Kerry and they were they were and, reporting and that forget. on the BBC. Let well, me well, I was like not in America and they were reporting and you that and, and, and let me let me remind people of this before obama the great black hope was colin powell in yeah. the 90s i remember my dad who is not a conservative not that political being like he had colin powell's book and he was like this is going to be the next black president and i was like whatever nigga. but <laughs> yeah. obama was this huge fucking just beacon of hope for all these people that felt like and maybe it was, it was a very liberal thing that felt like there was a dumb guy in office for the last eight years and now we've got an adult in the room again and that felt like the conversation and it was like absolving you of whatever racist shit happened in your past if your family owned a slave or two you voted for obama and you can absolve yourself. If you call somebody the N-word in 12th grade, you voted for Obama and you absolve yourself. If you didn't fuck that black guy because he was a black guy back in you know high school, you absolve yourself. What, what happened with me as a product of the Obama presidency and writing for Black Agenda Report and my deep dish dive into reading black political history is that what you realize is that the people who manufactured Obama had a better understanding of black political history than many of the black people who supported Obama. Mm. And that's why they were able to curate him into what he was. Because they, if you look at, for example, all of his staff, a lot of them work on uh, Harold Washington's administration in Chicago. Mm. These were people who had understood how do you make a black candidate popular to white people to empower him to rise to a position where he is doing the actual job of capital. So he was being groomed by people who knew how to utilize black political iconography at the behest of capital at a very early stage. I Listen, a lot of people don't know this about Bruce Dixon, my my closer friend and mentor who was editor of Black Agenda Report as well, is that Bruce Dixon trained Barack Obama as a community organizer in the voting campaign that he talks about in his book in the early 90s. And the first thing Bruce told me is that the first thing they told him when he met this guy Obama, they were like, this guy's going to be the first black president. This is like the late, early, late 80s, early 90s. And he was like, okay, well, that's interesting. So he was in the Chicago Foundation. I mean, Dylan knows this better than I do. The Chicago Liberal Foundation world early on. For people who know, Chicago is a very important bellwether city for Democratic Party politics because it is the fulcrum of Democratic votes in what otherwise would be a Republican state. Mm -hmm. So all of these factors allowed this guy to be literally politically constructed in a Petri dish where his imagery and narrative was constructed in a way to play on all of the symbolism and the symbolic rhetoric that had been aspirationally planted on. He vindicated upper middle class black people who wanted to see someone who replicates their corporate duplicity, but in a presidential form. All of that was was easily manufactured. The you know, the, the, the 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 biracial guy with the chocolate working class wife who was Ivy League educated as well who you know for a fact he wouldn't date for a million years if he didn't want to be president because he'd been chasing white women his whole life. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's all I know my brother. 
you know? It was all contrived, and it was very effective. I wrote a piece. Did you, did you just say Obama was chasing white women his whole life and the Michelle shit's a lot? Look at all the women he was dating before before he met Michelle. Maybe she just, just the beauty of Michelle Obama struck him so much, he started shoving white women to the side and was like, this is what I need in my life. I don't know too many guys who were dipping in the snow who all of a sudden want some chocolate ice cream after doing that for a while. <laughs> Damn, I can't... <laughs> That's a that's a heavy. You know we on white people's channel tonight at the same time, right? You <laughs> just lost the left. <laughs> Obama was really the prototype for Donald Trump, right? But from a different. They're angle. cousins. They're cousins. Well, because one of the appeals of Barack Obama is also that he triggered the reaction race, right? He triggered the reaction race, so they got all het up, screaming and saying all kinds of outlandish and bizarre things. And the, you know, the liberals could chuckle away at how backwards and parochial the opposition are, how terrible the Republicans. <laughs> but he was a celebrity president. He was like the first wanna, celebrity president. Oh, I'm not going to listen. Listen, as much as I had contempt for what he represented politically, I will say this: the guy had great Barack Obama was a political prodigy I'm not going to lie in mm -hmm. terms of oratorical skill in terms of campaigning he I mean I mean you it's going to happen but you just can you imagine I will push back on the orator he again comes in after Bush after eight years of Bush and P and he did that kind of Kennedy-esque thing with that midwestern flair and his accent <clears throat> And he didn't have to say much to get people to lose their fucking mind because George Bush was just fumbling over words for the for eight years. And after that, I, I had to watch so many fucking Obama speeches to do a few of these video essays that I remember walking away from him like, I I used to say the exact same thing you're saying right now. I never thought I, he was a yeah. I, I, I used to, I've, Pascal, I'm telling you, I felt the same way until I had to sit there and watch hours of this Negro speak. And I was like, I don't think he's really that fucking crazy. Corny. He's very. Well, Rach, I remember when that guy murdered those people in the church in, was it Georgia? The, the, the young Matt, white supremacist kid killed those people in the black church. On uh, Rachel Maddow's show, right? Mm -hmm. They, uh, she she like stopped the show and said we have to listen to this important moment and it was literally Barack Obama, Obama singing Amazing Grace. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I'm not joking. That's like not word of I was like, what the hell is going on? And it's like listen listen to this important moment. Well, it is though. What is that channeling though? He's channeling a a, a touchstone. Oh, I, I got something for you, Pascal. I got something for you, Pascal, because here's the other thing. On top of what you just said, which was brilliant, Obama activated the civil rights generation, the black civil rights generation. He activated yes. the black civil rights generation against the emergent abolitionist, black, queer, feminist, incarcerated, it's formerly incarcerated radical left. You like he so? brought that respect, he brought the respectability this card thing, out though. by way of by way it of is. the civil rights generation. But this is the thing, though. Obama is not elevated on the backs of the baby boomer civil rights generation. It was Generation X blacks. Oh, absolutely, elevated. absolutely. But I'm saying, listen to his, listen to his speeches to the NAACP. Oh yeah, no, he appropriated. You know, which is, he like, appropriated yeah. All of no, this the rhetoric, the rhetoric, and the performance of respectability. All is, of that. Is, he is, was, is, he is you know, he violating. He tries to listen. There's a speech that he talks about about the um this biblical generation not the uh not the, the the not the the generation of moses but the uh what's the next generation in the bible that comes after moses comes through exodus after the exodus the um the joshua generation the joshua he referred to him as the lead like himself as part of the joshua generation using all these kind of like biblical allegory to talk about his narrative and who he was it was very very sick and duplicitous the way he was able to use these kind of very very sensitive cultural touchstones within the overall barometer of black spirituality religiosity popular culture music 
art, hip hop. They knew it all. And what I'm saying is that if we don't understand that this was curated, this was studied, this was manufactured, then we don't understand why he was so effective at getting. I mean, listen, there are people who still have pictures of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Obama in their house to this day, man. Could leave my daddy out of this. Well, really, he was a plant by the Muslim Brotherhood designed to <laughs> the United States from within. He practiced the art of taqiyya, which is where you uh, conceal your true beliefs in Islam, went in front of the kafa, and uh, defeat them from within by weakening them. And that was what Obama did. He successfully unraveled the, the fabric of American society with his neoliberal shenanigans and his capitulation. And, he, and you know what any you know what any old black dude would tell you if you said something bad about Obama, he'd be like, "It's not him, it's the Congress and the Senate." It's like oh, the czar. It's not the czar's fault. It's those evil advisors. But it's, you know, it's... people still do it. The Trump yeah. people do it as well. They're like, "Oh, Trump would do this," but you know, it's his evil advisors. Same excuses they make for uh, Obama, and you know, that's that's what it comes down to. Like these guy, both Trump and Obama, came in riding a discourse of change yes uh, which was pseudo change right which was a change in form not in substance because barack obama delivered the same kind of bullshit any other democratic president would have delivered uh and donald trump did the same bullshit a republican would do it he just said it in a meaner way well right? the same thing happens with, with clinton right i think we always forget too that the, the uh, first a lot of the things that Reagan never got to see come to fruition, even in the 12 years of all that Republican rule, it happens in Clinton. You finally mm -hmm. get full financial deregulation. You finally get a gutting of, of uh, services with, with welfare reform. That happens during Clinton. It doesn't get any better during Obama. But all these people run on a faux populism of this is the reckoning. And what frightens me more so about the, <clears throat> less about the individuals but more about us as a society is that all it takes is just rhetoric there was never a movement when clinton came into office to really push him to do anything there definitely wasn't a movement when obama comes into office to do anything i mean there was a movement to get him elected and then that gets you know dismantled once he gets into office and well, what happens to all that energy well, this Where does that energy then go? Sorry, well, this is one of the consequences of the fifty-plus year counter-revolution: is that these these individuals are rising in the nadir of political consciousness after movement politics disappears from the, the the psyche of the American body politic, definitely within Black politics, because we have the rise of the Black political class that comes out of the Gary Convention of seventy-two that really ushers Black politics in the direction of neoliberalism so now we have black politicians who are literally getting more money from corporate funding sources than white politicians which is something that would have been unheard of in the 70s or in, their, or in the 80s but yet that's the reality we have right now you know where we have politicians like you know hakeem jeffries screaming, screaming israel for today tomorrow and forever <laughs> in videos that we're seeing I mean, it's, it's almost kind of cartoonish, cartoonish, man. This is a guy whose uncle is Leonard Jeffries, who is one of the most like, like, re, like considered radical, like despised academics in New York City in the '80s because of his positions as being an anti-Semite. Not anti-Semite. Now, well, Hakeem Jeffries is like, you know, Israel today, tomorrow, and forever. It's cartoonish, man. Is that, that sounds like was that Strom Thurmond? Who was that? Or George Wallace? I say what? segregation now. <laughs> segregation tomorrow. Was that George Wallace? What's George Wallace? Yeah. So yeah, I, man. But but again, I I just I feel like there's this, and it's not just something you see online. You, you sometimes you actually hear it in people's you know day to day discussions if you talk politics. I'm definitely not one of those people like oh I won't talk politics. Um, I love to hear what people think. And there's the, like even with this railroad strike, to hear people say things like Joe Biden betrayed the rail workers. I'm like, why do you think Joe Biden was ever on the side of the rail workers? Where's the betrayal? Seriously, Joe I'm Biden, asking you guys this question. Where is the betrayal? If Joe Biden 
supported the rail workers, he'd be betraying. Uh, he'd be betraying his backers, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, where, do you, where <laughs> this is, is this at? This is what happens when movements for ethnic or national liberation become unmoored from uh, a class critique. And you don't just see this in the United States. You see this around the colonial world where fights which begin not just as fights for national liberation or for, for, for justice, they succeed to a certain degree and then they just become purely culturalized. Right? They, mm -hmm. they increasingly become right-wing as the economic message and the radical message of material redistribution is pushed away in favor of symbolic cultural gestures, right? It's the same dynamic that drives the Iranian regime to mechanistically get people to come out and say death to America, right? <laughs> it just, be, you know, like... Well, let me, it, let me ask you this, Gene. I, I sent you something, and I, I don't know if I sent it to Pascal, and Press TV, and I know you have your feelings about Press TV, um, interviewed the U.S. football coach mm -hmm. at the World Cup. I'm going to respect you, my British brother. Um, and said, how can you support a country or that has all these people locked up? And I was like, dude, literally, aren't you Iranian TV? Like, isn't there some protests going on in your hood right now? Like, is that a little pot and kettle right there? I mean, that's, I mean, that's the same game everybody plays, right? Point, it's, it's easy to point out the other person's sins, uh, but it's more difficult and costly to point out your own sins and if you just make your critique cultural right mm -hmm. then you know that's something you can resolve right it's not about dealing with people's emotional interests uh, uh material interests it's just about making people feel like you know validated or that their way of life is acceptable and capitalism can deal with that Right. Well, one of the things I wanted to add here is I think that one of the things that all of us high fluent intellectuals, and I'll include Jason here as well, fail to realize is that most, a lot of people don't like to really talk about politics. And a lot of people feel that it's really just, frankly, something that's unpleasant that they don't want to get into. And it's not, and they don't feel that they get anything out of it. There's no return on investment. And what you do find is that the people who are into it are so into it that they became, they become kind of like, they're caping for their team, for their side, mm -hmm. you know, all, you know, and everyone is playing for their side and there's no objective space where we can actually have a fair conversation about it because everyone is taking a position. We might be left, some people might be right, so on and so forth, and we believe that we're right about what we, what we believe, but other people believe that they're right about what they believe. But the point I'm trying to say is that it's very hard to get people in this time, even people, even though we're more politicized than we've been in some parts of the past to really think about politics as a means of changing their condition. It's hard to get people to believe that something can change as a result of politics. And as a result, it makes the, 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 the options that you can present to them even more narrow. Yeah, I, I, I've been quiet because I've been listening to y'all um, eating shit right now because I, I don't think we're actually talking about politics. We're talking about we're talking about the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And what Pascal, what you just started getting at is the fact that that's why people withdraw from that shit. Because it doesn't actually, th th there's a material as well as an intuitive understanding that that stuff doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of whether you're going to choose to watch MSNBC, CNN, or Fox. Right? As you said, it's about caping for your team. And that's not what politics really is. But what passes as political talk, this is what I'm going to say about this. The way in which we have come to understand talk of politics is counterinsurgency in action because at mm. that point we are no longer talking about trying to confront analyze and challenge actual relations of power and domination and violence what we're really talking about is what to do with the democratic party and i'm talking about most of the people that we care to talk to you mm. know what i mean because those folks on the other side what's what's ironic about what i'm saying is that it's when we confront the motherfuckers <coughs> on the other side you know, the folks who, whatever, whatever, they're voting for, for, for Republican, whatever. Like, with them, it's far more explicit 
that our position with each other is one of absolute irreconcilable antagonism. It's yes. actual war. It's actual war. At that point, you actually are talking politics because now it's like, I want your ass dead. Like, I don't, if you die right now, I will celebrate, right? Because that means that there, that there's, that there's a micro shift in the relations of power because you're off the fucking planet, right? That's actually, that, that's, that's actual politics, right? This bullshit with thinking about AOC and Bernie um, and, and, and whether Biden betrayed somebody or not, or whether he was actually just doing his job, Biden did his job, right? As y'all just said, right? Biden fulfilled his destiny, as y'all just said, right? That's not actually talk of politics, right? This is actually just melodrama. What we're doing, that's that's the counterinsurgency. The counterinsurgency well, is that we get stuck in melodrama. Question. I, I would, well, hold on, let me push back. I disagree wholeheartedly because you're also assuming that everybody knows what you're talking about. And and I think my thing is I'm bringing I'm not that. assuming that. I dispute your premise. I don't assume that. I want to explain my premise to you. I don't okay, assume remember, that. Remember, man, look, hey, homie, we on the same time zone, man. We can we I can. love you. I love you. That's why I'm yelling at you. <laughs> no, I'm uh, what I'm saying is I I think that it is important to acknowledge the fact that this is a way that people do think about this stuff. Yeah. I feel you on that. That's the problem. Dress it call it out yeah. for what it is i'm not saying the conversation ends there it shouldn't right but but here, here's the problem right here's the problem is that we're not you know where the conversation tends to end hmm. is, is when is when you look at the smoldering remains of that police station in minneapolis mm -hmm. right that that's that's where the conversation ends there's really not a conversation how does it end there what happened i'm saying i'm saying i'm saying i'm saying in terms of the way we're talking about the talk of politics right uh -huh. I'm, a lot of the folks that we're talking about here uh -huh. don't understand that as politics they understand they understand that as something else they understand that as something outside the realm of respectable politics and that's 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 part of what i'm saying is the problem mm -hmm. i'm saying the center of the conversation should be that the center of the conversation should be the debate over whether, uh, for example, you know, um, the correct response to the police killing yet another unarmed black civilian should be trying to prosecute that cop. That's a political conversation, right? Is the appropriate response to try to prosecute that cop or should we be thinking about other forms of response? That's a political conversation, right? Like, like, like if, if our response to the police killing another unarmed civilian black person is to say our commitment is to prevent this from ever happening again. What do we do? That's a political conversation. And we've all at that point, we've already obsoleted. We've squeezed out the Democratic Party. They're mm -hmm. gone. Right? Because all the Democratic Party is going to do is give us a bunch of pro-cop bullshit, right? Disguised as as you know, the George Floyd Act or whatever. Whatever, whatever, whatever the flavor is going to be this month. I mean, I think we have those conversations, and I think we always try to go even even deeper than just prosecuting yeah. the cop because it doesn't end. At the prosecuting of of one officer, right? Right. No, no, no. I mean, but I don't, I don't mean to get sucked into that. All, all I'm saying is that is that I think the pre the premise I've increasingly started talking to people from is, mm -hmm. is the notion that the Democratic Party is the front lines of counterinsurgency against freedom struggles mm -hmm. of all kinds, right? Mm -hmm. It is the front line of the counterinsurgency, <laughs> right? It, it's it's like it's not it's not merely inadequate to the demands of people that are struggling for various forms of justice, liberation, and freedom. It's not just inadequate to that. It is actively undermining that, right? And that's what the Democratic Party, all you gotta do is look at what's happened with the Black Lives Matter Global Foundation. Look at who they've appointed to their board. It's former, it's recent, it's not just former, recent, recent Democratic Party high operatives. That's who they've appointed to their boards. That is active counterinsurgency right there. Right. You had a movement that was premised on, on the on the concepts of abolitionist struggle, diasporic revolution, black revolution, abolitionist struggle that now is appointing democratic operatives to its board of. of but isn't that, also a problem, I mean, Dylan, Dylan, isn't that also a problem, Dylan, with the movement itself, though? I mean, oh, because, yeah. Because the movement itself, the ideological orientation of a lot of these movements prime them for reincorporation or at least the reincorporation of certain segments and certain elements of discourse into the democratic party and that becomes an ideological apparatus which initially is you know directed against the system and then comes to reinforce the system just as how you have yeah. nowadays a whole uh, and pascal's talked about this quite uh, you know quite forcefully today for example like if you go back to you know the days of jesse jackson 
you know, the black element within the Democratic Party, and again, this is in the Democratic Party, was at least, you could say, on the left of the Democratic Party. But now, if you look at the majority of the black political class, not only are they in the Democratic Party, but they also gravitate towards the right wing of the Democratic uh, Party and strategically use, quote unquote, the discourse of social justice to uh, attack more radical programs that are directed to do towards redistribution of wealth, who transform discussions on racial justice into a grifting opportunity whereby, there it is. Uh, whereby everybody is is innately racist therefore they have to forever go to my training session which i run through my ngo and do permanent uh, permanent racial sensitivity training the the you know where they turn the they turn the issue of violence against uh poor communities many of whom uh disproportionately people uh, from minority groups where they turn it to an issue of not the police violence but because the police called you an n-word when they uh, beat you up. Does it make a difference whether the guy's beating you up and going, sir, you're resisting, sir, you're resisting, or he's using the n because he's still using the same line. So, the, you know, back in the 60s, and I forget who wrote this, one of the feminist activists from the 60s, you know, made the point, not only did we fail to get, you know, equality for women, our discourse was reincorporated into capitalism and used as a stick to beat us into the workforce Mm. Uh, and uh, so we ended up equating our liberty with integration into the capitalist workforce, doubling our work where we still do the social reproduction. But now to be a quote unquote liberated woman, you have to have a career and, you know, you, 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 you are given these contradictory messages. So, so much of this liberation discourse from the 1960s ended up being just gobbled up by the elites and spat back out at people and used precisely as you say as a counterinsurgency uh towards you know in britain the conservatives are always going on about the fact that hey we didn't just have one woman prime minister we had two women prime ministers now we have an indian prime minister look look you know what are you talking about you know and 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 stuff like that so that you know the like there is a fundamental problem i think with uh I don't know how we can deal with it, but there's a fundamental problem with these movements in that they seem so quickly to be reincorporated into the Democratic Party. It's part of the plan. And, and weaponized it's, against them. They're all the finance from the left flank of capital. The foundation yeah. world this is the, the, yeah. the foundation go ahead, go ahead. world is backing yeah. the left. That's the bottom line. Capitalism funds the left. The problem that we're talking about is as old as the popular front strategy in the during the, the, the 40s in which the left decided to come in with the liberals and support them with the fight against fascism and they got obliterated with the McCarthy era. And from that point on, the Democratic Party has been more effective at neutralizing the left than giving it any voice. I don't disagree with Dylan at all whatsoever, but what I'm saying is that where are the cadres that we have in our community? Exactly. That are ready for revolution. Okay, and who is ready to actually talk. Wait a minute, before ask out, wait a minute, before you start talking about revolution, before anybody starts talking about goddamn revolution, really, you have to define what you mean by that because everybody, when you say that shit, and you 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 can't be so flippant with it. People think that you are going to be the one storming the Capitol with your Walmart shotgun. So, can you please define what you mean by revolution? <laughs> I'm at, what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that the revolution is coming. I'm actually one of the people who are saying that, listen, until there is going to be a point where there is a revolution. What is the revolution? Fight. Stop. What is it? Revolution is the ability to change the political terms okay. of the ruling class. Okay. And how but is that going to happen? Is it going to happen to a violent insurrection? Because you keep saying it obviously, like you're obviously that's that's a, Obviously, that's a part of it, Jason. How? How, 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 how are you going to not talk about violence when you talk about revolution? easy is the 50-year counter-revolution that we talk about on this show violent yes how was violent involved with that was like the main the main man, I mean, you I heard mean, of the there prison was a, there was a lot of violence used in man, man you heard of the prison industrial complex stop stop that didn't stop, stop anybody what from mean, doing what anything mean, stop what do you mean stop i mean prison look, what do you mean what real do you mean talk real talk real talk real talk 
seriously. My position is this. I'm dead serious. I don't believe. I, I, I don't I don't often talk about So you telling me the police was going in the streets just rounding niggas up for no reason, throwing every nigga in jail? Not no. every, not every, but two million. <clears throat> There's a lot more than two million. Well, look, I think when we look when we talk about revolution. Are you coming? Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Time out, time out, time out. Can we talk about anti-black criminalization real quick and like oh. how that works? Sure. And like, and like what this means sure. that it's not it's not even just disparity, it's asymmetry. Sure. And it's paradigmatic to the entire criminal justice system and policing and that this is what people get trained to do as soon as they enter the academy. Sure. And that this is this is this is part of, this is central to the 50-year counter-revolution ongoing is domesticating, pacifying and neutralizing black populations in particular. Sure. Especially working class and poor black populations that are poised for insurrection, insurgency and destroying property. Look, they love when cats destroy property because that's all you do is destroy property. What changed in Minneapolis? Are, are you for real? Have you talked to people from what Minneapolis? What changed in Minneapolis? I'm waiting for the answer. Don't tell me about real. What changed? Political what relations in the city of Minneapolis have permanently happen? changed. No, no. Nothing political changed. relations. If you talk to people who are on the ground in Minneapolis, the political relations in the city of Minneapolis have changed permanently. They haven't done shit with that police station that burned down. It's still sitting there. So what? It's still sitting there. What changed? What do you mean, so what? Are you scared of failure? Are you scared of failure? Why am I scared of failure? Well, okay, then, then what's wrong? What so, changed? So, like, so, so my my point is this. My point is this. If we before we define what revolution is, which is a pretty audacious task, by the way, I don't know. I don't know that that that's an individual's task. First of all, right? I don't know that's an individual's task, right? But what I think can be thought about collectively mm -hmm. is insurgency and insurrection, right? Insurgency and the meaning of it. And that's the question you just asked. And I'm willing. I think we should have a whole show on that. Right. Like what happens when you have insurgency and insurrection, right? And shit burns and property is destroyed, right? And certain relationships are 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 are, are confronted and challenged violently, right? That, what changes? Right? I think we could, this is a long conversation, my friend. What changed in 92? What changed in 68? I'll tell oh, you want to what hey, I'll tell you what changed in 92. A gang truce happened only because of the rebellions in the street of and property burning what? in 92. It's not like it went no, forever. No, it that's, happened that's for, major. A, for a couple of you years. Come to LA, you come to LA and talk to people that were there when 92 happened. They will tell you that that the, the form of unity and solidarity that happened because of the rebellion, mm -hmm. where people were convening to talk about the, the gang truce is a paradigmatic moment in that city that people don't. And, that, and, and the state had to mobilize counterinsurgency to try to mute and neutralize that gang truce because it wasn't just a gang truce that gang truce was preparation for something else what was the gang that truce changed preparation for? that it was preparation number one to stop internecine bloodshed auto genocide as native americans would call it that changed does that count my friend to, to at least put a temporary halt to auto genocide does that change that counts right brother that counts right if i can brother. call you my brother brother Brother, and I that mean counts, that. Right? In, I mean that in a serious way. If we stop that for for ten minutes, it counts, yeah. right? Look, all right. As someone I'm, I'm that saying, comes saying... from, as someone that comes from not L.A. but up north in a very similar environment, all I'm saying is, you're talking about short moments that disappear. That police station burned down in Minneapolis. The police were supposed to be totally defunded. Nothing happened. We did a whole show with the journalist that actually recorded that conversation with the mayor where he was like, I'm not defunding the police. And he was like, nothing happened. A few people from that movement got into office. But overall, Nothing happened because a lot of okay. the people that were involved in burning the police station down just wanted to burn some shit down. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? If you can't catch I don't have a problem that energy, with that. Look, I'm not saying that's it. I'm not saying that's it. But I'm saying, but I'm saying here's the problem I'm trying to point out, right? Number one, Jesse Jackson disassembled his own party. We need to keep saying that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesse Jackson was on the cusp of constituting a viable third party that would fuck up the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. He his he disassembled it voluntarily. For right? fat pack and biscuits. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
You said it, not me, right? That's number one. Number two, the answer to your part of the answer to not the answer, part of the explanation for this depressing scenario, Jason, is that is that people like us participate in undermining the insurrection by way of denigrating and minimizing its possibilities and what it opens up, even as it's domesticated and pacified and neutralized. I'm saying it's a compl- it's a much more complex scenario than something changed or not changed. Of course, something changed. The police station's gone. That's changed. So what? Right. The police no, ain't? It mob- hey, it, it forced a mobilization for people to respond to a challenge to their power. Otherwise, they took it for granted. Oh, you, you are reading way too much in that shit. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm talking to people that are on the ground that will that that, that, that are living with the precedent of being mm-hmm. in the street, challenging direct conf- in direct confrontation with police power. There's a difference, though. Well, let me ask you that a question. That is a change. But let, let me ask you a question. Go. What were the what were the actual political manifestations that changed in a positive way as a consequence of the Arab Spring? The Arab Spring? Yeah. All the all these examples, all these examples produce so, so J- Jason, I'm I'm conceding this to you, right? They mm-hmm. produced moments, vulnerable, mm-hmm. fleeting moments of autonomy, of actual autonomy. To me, to me, that shit is meaningful in this moment where shit is so crushing, it's so absorptive, it's so repressive. Like any any example, any example where people can constitute sites of radical autonomy against the state, particularly against police power, colonial power, mm-hmm. you know, neoliberal capitalism, racial capitalism, any constituting a, a, any people who can constitute sites of autonomy from that, to me, that 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 shit is meaningful, even as it gets repressed. Right, but you it's realize an experiment. That, this whole thing's a beautiful fucking experiment. That's what revolution is. That's my definition of revolution. That, that, that in the modern age, I, I, I would agree with you if we were living in 1791 or 92. In the modern ages, the forces of counter revolution, technology, surveillance, state, and, and, and so forth, military and otherwise, made the capacity to exploit those move those moments of subterfuge much and much much more difficult and the weight of counter-revolutionary mm-hmm. force much much stronger so you get much less bang for your urban rebellion in 1992 and in 2020 than you get in 1967 because the material nature of the state and its capacity to bring forth counter-revolutionary force against the rebellion is stronger than before. So one of the consequences of calculating revolution and rebellion is to calculate how is the force of counter-revolution and counter-rebellion going to be able to neutralize my ability to create this little opening of readjustment. Let me give you a concrete example, a concrete example. In 2015, uh, in Turkey, in in, in Turkish Kurdistan, there was a mass uprising of the youth. And this, you know, they dug trenches and there were insurrections in Diyarbakir, in Shernak, in Mardin, all these cities across the east in response to the conflict in Syria. It was a huge rebellion and it was a popular rebellion that the Kurdish insurgency forces had to follow because the youth were taking the lead and and, and doing an insurrection. Not only were these brutally suppressed by the Turkish state, but the in the aftermath, the rebuilding process in these cities operated in such a way to make sure that the, you know, entire uh, neighborhoods were cleared out uh, on under the uh, uh, under this uh, title of, um, you know, uh, rebuilding and reconstruction, the whole urban fabric was uh, transformed. And my skepticism of rebellion, for example, burning stuff down, if you think you can take power, you don't burn it down, you take it over, right? If you're burning thing without a... Sometimes. Without a, uh, without a program and some kind of disciplined force, you know, these things uh, can unleash a level of reaction that goes so deep as to uh, basically make future insurrection impossible. From 1961 to 1988, Iraqi Kurdistan was in permanent rebellion against the central government. The solution that the Ba'ath Party came to in the end was the Amphal campaigns where instead of fighting the guerrillas, they just burned down all the villages 
and destroyed the material basis for the insurrection. So you know, and and I've seen like for, you know firsthand the aftermath of these in, uh, of these insurrections. Now you don't blind people for for rising up against their di dictators, but it is not a it is not a um, it, it's not a uh, something to be taken lightly. And the state uses violence. I would say I would actually agree with Dylan. You know, like if we talk about the 50 year counter revolution. Yeah, it's not people busting down your door, but you have the grinding day in day out violence perpetrated by capitalism. Uh, you have uh, you have the increasing securitization of social problems. So the police, why are the police so fucking violent in these neighborhoods? You come to my neighborhood in Springfield, police are very friendly and nice. It's because the police aren't dealing with. But the if you want to call it, but let me let me say this in in kind of more plain terms. If we want to say that's violence, that's one thing. But I think people have to understand in a lot of people's minds that live in these communities, as someone that's grew up in these communities, everyone doesn't look at that as violence. Mm -hmm. Even though their kids have to go through dealing with the motherfucking police for being kids. That's true. It's kind of like, well, my kid's not a drug dealer. My kid's not in a gang. That's Ergo. a political failure on our part. Okay. that I'll accept that. But yeah. that's my point when I say, when I say, you know, if I come out and say, this is just my, <clears throat> on how, this is how I treat these discussions when I'm in the public sphere. If I come out and say, this shit is violence, there's a, there's a handful of people that are going to agree with me. Mm -hmm. And it's just depends how good, hey, depend, depends, Jason, depends how skilled you are at communicating that. Okay, Fred Hampton, well, was, good. Fred Hampton was good as fuck at convincing people that the normative state of things was deeply violent. Maybe I'm not a good communicator then. No, you're but a great communicator. Is, I'm saying you're not trying hard enough. Um, well, my point is, if I come out and say that, there's a group of people that are going to be with me because they're just fired up about it, and they generally don't have to deal with said violence. And maybe they weren't brought up in that same environment where it's like, look, you're this is what you do to man. not get in it's trouble. It's way more unpredictable than this. It's so much more unpredictable than this. Like, I agree. I've been in look, rooms, you're I've been talking in to, dude, you're talking man. to a man that can't go up north to see his kid because my car got damaged. That shit makes me sad, man. By the way, the that street. shit makes me sad when you talk about it. I get really sad when you talk about that. You, shit. you, you know, so I, you know where yeah. I'm coming from. Yeah, I do. I'm not coming shit, from yeah. a, a a bitch ass place of a fucking makes me sad. poetry. I'm yeah, coming from that real place of I understand. Yep. So maybe what I'm saying is you underestimate yourself. Shit. Maybe what I'm saying is you underestimate yourself. I think you under, I think I think we underestimate because somebody said it. I can't remember which which one of us, which one of y'all said it earlier, but we were talking mm -hmm. about rhetoric, right? How like rhetoric runs the place, basically. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. Rhetoric mm -hmm. runs the place. This is this is part of the problem with radicals, revolutionaries, abolitionists, whatever we want to call ourselves. I don't know if there's a left at this point. Like I don't really use that term because I because the people who you want to call left are usually liberals, right? So so whatever <laughs> this thing is, whatever this thing is. Um, I think I think part of what we have yet to get our, our our minds and hearts around is the fact that rhetoric runs the place. Word. I, I don't think we've I don't think we've arrived at an effective set of storytelling and narratives and rhetorical strategies and convincing ways of talking about this thing we're calling the violence of the police state, the violence Word. of the normative state. I don't think we've gotten to that. I think it's a pedagogical and political failure at this point. Right. Which is which is, by the way, that's part of the expo that's part of the response to your earlier question where you were challenging me around what happened in the aftermath of something like a police station burning. Well, there's a failure there. Right. There's and an insufficiency and a point. failure. But that, and, that and was I, my point. I'm saying this is part of it. What yeah. I'm talking about right now is part of it. It's central yeah. to it. It's not yeah. all of it, but it's part of it. My, my point is, I think my point is I was excited as everybody else was in this moment because it felt like for a change. There was kind of that scene in school days, wake up, right? Where's Pascal as Larry Fishburne is yelling, wake up at the end of school days. And then it went away. It went away quickly because everybody busted that nut once the fucking shit started burning. It was done. It's also because we don't have a program, right? We don't. There was no plan. There was no discipline. No, no, y'all are wrong. The problem is the program. The plot. The problem is the program that's there, which is a version of Alinskyism that was in the Bay Area. Uh, mm. What do you call it? Um, institutionalized by Van Jones. Now I and know others. you got a lot and of others. personal beef with, with Van Jones. It's not personal. It's not personal. It's political. 
Well, no, I know because he came in and, and fucked he, with y'all. He rep no, he represented capital and political domestication of um brilliant radical creative people. Like he came mm. in to domesticate and and hone them in and bring them in. And it was a it was a version of Alinskyism of so mm. Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals. Go read that book. It's like it's like the template for like liberal progressive counterinsurgency of the last 50 years, which is central to the counter revolution we're talking about, which is like mm -hmm. the, the non-state, like the extra state version of the counter revolution, right? Which is which is about winnable victories. And, and so anyway, I wasn't trying to be a, a smart ass about saying it is the program. The problem is the actual program, which is to harness everything back into winnable victories. Exactly. In, in the, I'm being yeah. simplistic about it, but like that's the Alinskyist model. But it's like, you know, I was always struck by the protests that took place in Sri Lanka. You know, like people, mm -hmm. there was a crisis in Sri Lanka and people stormed the goddamn president's palace and they were mm -hmm. on his Peloton machine, they were pulling the weights, they were swimming in the pool. And all I could think was like, they've like conquered the castle, but they just don't have, they don't have a program to do anything with that power. So what falls in their lap is like, you just get new faces and do the same old bullshit. That's what happened in the Arab Spring. As Pascal said, like what happened in Egypt? They uh, they had all these protests. The army stepped in. They removed the dictator. They let the Muslim Brotherhood in tra charge for a bit. And then the army was like, nah, we're coming back in power. And they threw all those guys in jail. That was one road. And the other road was like Syria, where they had the protests. And then the Syrian government was able to sectarianize it. And everyone started murdering each other for fucking still to this very day. Uh, because look if you look at the history of revolution in 1789 in france there was like a popular uprising that uh forced the constitution on the monarchy and then finally deposed the monarchy right you fast forward a hundred years later the bolshevik revolution or the chinese revolution uh or even the liberal revolutions of the early 20th century in china in in, in iran and in, in the ottoman empire those weren't like the 1789 those were organized by disciplined political groups and political parties because the power of the state over the 19th century had increased to such an extent the only way to combat it was to have a far more organized i mean why the fuck when when did they start bringing cops on the street in europe uh 1848 there was the there was the revolutions in europe in 1848 and then all the regimes were like shit we need cops to keep to make sure that this shit doesn't happen that's when all these police forces were founded now we've had another hundred years after these uh, revolutions of the early 20th century and state power as pascal indicates has grown to such by such prestigious degrees that the type of paradigm of revolution that we have in our head or at least that many people have in their head about what a revolution is going to look like is based on a model that was applicable in Tsarist russia in 1917. <laughs> Right I, now, with all you know, due to respect to the Russian Revolution, this is not freaking Tsarist Russia, right? Um, so, you know, I don't know what a revolution is going to look like, but these urban rebellions we saw, of course, they represent legitimate people being pissed mm -hmm. off with mm -hmm. the system, right? I want to address something very clearly, and this is really my, my, I want to make my position very, very clear. I am not anti revolution by any stretch of the imagination. But I believe that revolution is something that comes with opportunity. There was an opportunity of moment that allowed the Haitian Revolution to move from insurgency to full military, military absolute revolution. And what I'm saying is that the nature of the state today and capital makes those opportunities very specific. My position is that in order to have a revolution in a modern capitalist society like we have in the world today, it will take the precipice of internal collapse first before the momentum is strong enough to create that. So my position is that I don't believe that revolution is impossible, but I believe that the internal contradictions of the capitalist machine will require precipice of collapse, meaning that the shit is on the brink of falling but, apart. Yeah, but here, here's the thing. If we're in collapse now, which I believe I we are, I believe we're in collapse. We just don't know what collapse looks like. We don't know. We don't know how long it's going to take. Right? Do we know? Like I don't frogs, necessarily frogs, that's frogs, not the problem, though. The, the, prob the problem is that the problem is that the so-called, the alleged so-called left is more concerned with managing the collapse than inducing it. 
<laughs> and that's 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 the point I wanted to add to Pascal's point, right? Mm -hmm. If the if 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 what you require are are, are some set of material conditions that facilitate mm -hmm. something along the lines of what we might name in this moment a revised conceptualization of revolution, or whatever. Again, to me, it's a fucking beautiful experiment, full of failure and full of beauty and joy and fucking celebration and rage, right? That's to me what 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 the, the the road to revolution is like i don't know what revolution is man i'm not that arrogant like i'm not that narcissistic i'm not assuming i'm going to live to see revolution in my lifetime right i'm down i'm down for guerrilla war and insurgency and insurrection that somehow facilitates whatever revolution might be then i think that the responsibility in part is to think about inducing the collapse water protectors are doing that shit in a certain kind of way Right, the well, folks at the folks at Mauna Kea way. in Hawaii, like that, are stopping the building of that of that fucking telescope. They're inducing yeah. that in another kind of way, right? The, you know, the 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 uh, black radical and revolutionary study groups in prison, post Attica, that my friend Orsani Burton at American University studying, like they, they're they're trying to induce that in another kind of way, right? At these different at these different sites. So it's I mean it's 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 a fucking experiment. Well, well let me ask places. this question: January sixth to me is an interesting moment. Me and Jean talked about this around the time that it was happening. That uh, this is the moment where the U.S. is going to take a harder line approach to insurrection. And San Francisco just passed that new bill where they're going to have these robots that are going to be allowed to shoot people. I'm sure everybody saw that. And the last time I saw a robot kill somebody, and I don't know if it's happened since then, was a few years ago in Dallas when a gentleman killed some cops. And they said that he was killed by one of these robots. I don't find it coincidental that San Francisco of all cities, where I've never seen, I mean, Dylan, you, you, you've been around the Bay for a minute. Maybe you've seen some things or, or know more about it than I do. I don't remember any sort of super violent insurrections in the city of San Francisco that would call for anything more than the police force they have now. Look, you're correct. And by violence, I'm not just talking, I'm not limited to talking about burning police stations down either, right? I'm also talking about um, other forms of rhetorical and discursive violence, which are, which are just as shattering and destructive, which nobody wants to engage in either, by the way. Right. Like like your language, our language gets policed. Our rhetoric gets policed by our own folks. What, 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 I'm, what I'm saying is I think that the state is going to be more swift. What's new? What's mm. new? But the state, the, 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 mm. the, the state is not all encompassing and invincible. Y'all like that's the other thing that we got to understand here. Like that mm. the state fucks up all the time. It's got these drone strikes and it fucks up and it doesn't it doesn't strike where it's supposed to strike. And it kills all these other people. And then it induces another fucking set of resistance against it because it fucked up the surgical precision strike that was supposed to come on. The, the state is the state is the, I agree. The state's technology are constantly expanding. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, and and shit. What makes it worse is that this so-called alleged left participates in certain ways in trying to be part of that state by way of the Democratic Party and other counterinsurgent institutions, right? So I'm not even disputing that shit is fucked up. I'm not saying that, right? But I'm also saying that there that there's all these sites of 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 you know insurgent autonomy of contradiction and really of just creativity that are happening all around us. And I don't think I don't think that. That's saying anything. I don't think I'm saying anything profound when I say that. Look, look, look at look at look at what these. You know, you know what some of the best lessons I've learned recently are from these folks that did the Strike MoMA movement. They literally created a new front of guerrilla war against uh, blue blood imperial philanthropy and, for that matter, the oh, nonprofit the, the industrial complex paintings. of the state. They, they came. No, they came after. They came after the entire high art philanthropic apparatus by way of striking on the Museum of Modern, Modern Art in New York. Right. And they expose they expose. I'm saying mm -hmm. I'm just like they radical, a radical disruption of that shit. They did not know what to do with these artists. Right. They did. They had no. And then the artists, then they then they quickly disassembled and they started doing other shit. So I'm in conversation with them now. They they, they quick. They, they they left that the strike mm -hmm. and they reassembled in other forms. They're doing other creative shit now. They're like creating sites. Of, but how is that different than ad busters or, you know, the situation is because the, the ideology. The ideology, I mean, to get to, to, to the point that we've raised here, right? The idea of having some kind of program by which I'm translating that here to mean some kind of ideological analytical program, they have that. Like it's really sophisticated and they bring people into conversation. In other words, study, 
there's an actual program of study involved as part of as something that is part of constituting the work the movement the mobilization, is that, is, the is, I, I felt like that was i don't know it felt like it was cute for a certain segment of society but a lot of people just don't care i mean that, that's usually how it is right it's not about winning I mean, everybody cared about burn look everybody cared about walmart's burning down one way or the another motherfuckers cared that's because yeah because because the because the, cons the consumer impulse for sure and, you know labor as well motherfuckers mm -hmm. work in walmart mm -hmm. that's, they're the, one of the largest employers in this country yeah. but i'm not saying fuck those people 100 percent. i'm just saying mm, who are you trying to reach with that i, I mean it's, it's not a populist movement so don't i mean i'm not i'm not trying to argue that it's somehow a totality that it's not Right. But what I am saying is it identified a new site of antagonism and was highly effective in disrupting and destroying and demystifying it such that these people were on the run. Like the entire, you know, art, art industrial apparatus was scrambling. They were thrown into crisis mm -hmm. by a small group of people. That's what I'm saying. It's, 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 it's like, it's like a humble point, but an important one. Right. And I think it's, it's exemplary of what can be done in other sites, including universities. What did you think, Pascal? I mean, I remember I was watching the, the the media coverage of that. I mean, I thought I thought it was interesting. I mean, it was disrupt, disruptive. I'm not into the art world, so that stuff only had like limited value to me. But I mean, right. I get I get the whole disrupting the kind of blue blood aesthetic of like art, bourgeois art, and you know, I mean, I, I get it. It definitely has some you know radical potential. But I mean, I don't see it. It doesn't really appeal to my politics of transforming on a material level, like conditions of people's quality of life and stuff like that. But I wouldn't like totally poo poo it. Yeah, right. yeah. So like, so maybe it wasn't for you, right? But like, the reason the reason I'm familiar with it is because they invited me into their program of study, and what yeah. it did, what it, what it is actively trying to do is to create another material reality for artists, right? Against I mean, I, the art apparatus, and I'm talking artists of all kinds. Let me tell you something. I, I'll be yeah. very honest with you. If I ever thought there was a moment where I would see the potential for insurgency to disrupt the function of everything it was during COVID. And I mean, I, I really thought that COVID <coughs> really created an opportunity for people to expose the contradictions of capital. And one of the most disturbing things to me is to see how much capital and the state have been able to reassess themselves mm. and to neutralize any mm. opposition to just insane denial of services and goods and care in the age of COVID. And I'm wondering, I was like, you know, is there really, you know, any, do people have it in them to rebel? Maybe people were too scared because of COVID, I don't know. But I just, my position is that a revolution is only as good as the people you create to fight it. And if you are not ready to actually create the cadre of people to fight it, don't talk about it. I'm with you on that. That's that's what I was saying to you earlier, Jason. That's the failure on the part of people like us. Thus far, failure thus far, I should say. Like I said, everything's what? a beautiful fucking experiment. Me, 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 meaning, meaning to just parrot what just what Pascal just said, right? Like, mm. if you're if you're serious about the path toward revolutionary activity, mm. you have to you have to produce subjects. Mm. You know, you have to produce loved ones and friends and comrades and communities that make each other feel invincible to put it in short terms right like that's what that's to me what i when i study the history of revolutions mm -hmm. that's usually what so, some version of that is usually what happens right is is that is that a community fosters and nurtures and cultivates a collective sense of historical being that emboldens in a kind of metastasizing beautiful way such that people feel first of all either they they feel some combination of invincible or willing to be martyred right and and, and like hey by the way a site where this shit is happening right now real time palestine i was gonna say but that becomes palestine right where everybody can't well, be murdered well that 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 historical record is being written as we speak right because because there, there's open discussion among that younger generation of 20 somethings, maybe even early 30 somethings that are openly talking about martyrdom 
And that's some shit I mean, people in the overdeveloped They've been talking West about that for talking a year. About. I mean, Chris Hedges. No, 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 but, but yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, I'm, but I'm saying, like, people who are, like, getting into shootouts with the Israeli, like, fucking police on, you know, I mean, like, anyway. It's, it's I mean, intensified. Like, like, that's all I'm saying. It's intensified at this point. Like an example of how these movements end up failing and becoming parochialized. Because, you know, the salvation uh, in, in, in Palestine involves, to a certain degree, uh, some kind of revolutionary movement that can transcend the sectarian divisions that divide that uh, divide Palestine, uh, divide uh, uh, Jewish people and uh, uh, Arab communities in Palestine. What we've seen in, in the last, you know, 50 years with the connivance of the Israeli intelligence service have has been the rise of radical quote-unquote islamic groups that yes they have enormous success in community building to a certain degree by offering services but their political program puts them in permanent opposition with the jewish community which means that you can't like if you go to israel like the poor israelis yeah they're better off than the arabs 100 percent, but they're getting screwed over by their own ruling class and, and unless you can unless you can sever the connection of people to their ruling classes, to their quote unquote community leaders and build cross sectarian class-based solidarity, Israel Palestine is just gonna be a butcher's uh, uh, block. And that's what's happening to the Palestinians. Slow motion murder, slow motion murder at the hands of the Israeli state. The Israeli state doesn't even have to exercise the level of violence it once did, it just routinizes it. And, and hides it, as you say, Dylan, you know, like that, so that people don't even conceive of it as violence through regimes of passports, through, uh, through a divide and rule by favoring certain groups. So like, I am, I'm skeptical, you know, I, I, you know, often I see like insurgents and, and uh, rebellion, as you saw in, in places like Palestine and Kurdistan, uh, in, in the Philippines, you know, those are signs of defeat because you're forced out of the urban centers and you're forced to, to the mountains, which is the only place that you can kind of continue to exist where the, the hold of the state is, is weakened. You can't challenge the power, so you retreat to the to And retreat it feels like it feels Retreat's like not power. the same as defeat. Retreat's not the same as defeat. That's all, because you use both words. I would say, yes, it's retreat. That's but, guerrilla but, war. But does it feel like, though, the state holds you there, though, in, in those outskirts, in the hinterlands? It's like Sometimes. Like, fine, Sometimes. stay there. I don't care. Sometimes. But look, you want to talk about the Philippines. There's been an ongoing 500-year insurgency against the Spanish colonization, the U.S. colonization, now the Philippine nation state. And it has not gone away. Despite proto-genocidal and actually genocidal violence, militarized violence, it has not gone away. Same with Palestine and Palestinians. And like the Palestinian youth contingent, which is breaking away from the programmatic, um, you know, kind of reactionary programmatic stuff that you were just talking about is vibrant. Well, because isn't, isn't a whole total genocide not kind of the plan? Isn't it just to crush the movement? No, well, genocide takes many forms, right? It's not just about physical elimination. It's about sustained uh, evisceration, cultural but, and otherwise. In addition to, you know, it's not just physical and physiological, it's cultural. Doesn't I mean, capital if, you the legal, if you look at the legal definition of genocide, which is a legal term, you can it's actually horrible, te you can yeah. technically have a genocide where no one's killed. Yeah. They sterilize people. And so it's no. a very, I mean, I... No. Kidnap I, I children, I, you destroy culture, like... Okay, yeah. but, okay, still... Don't you still need these bodies for your factories yeah. for now your gig work? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you, you just lock them up. Well, that's kind of interesting because in Palestine, mm -hmm. uh, re, you know, in the past, you know, immediately after the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip in particular, Palestinians constituted uh, like a massive reserve army of labor for Israel, right? One of the reasons that boycott divest, uh, you know, what is it, boy, uh, boycott divest, BDS, yeah. Yeah, BDS is became a viable politics was basically because the Israelis excluded the Palestinians from the workforce and replaced them with people from Russia mm. and uh, uh, other places. So that actually, because previously, and the know, Philippines, by the way, too. And the Phil yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. I mean, that's that's yep. the that's the gross national product is the export of their labor. Yep. So the so uh, so you know that only because in the past, if you've done that kind of policy, 
the people you'd hurt would be like poor Palestinians working in a factory, but now they've been excluded from the workforce. But you know, again, I see like Palestine as a as a freaking tragedy because the the Israeli state has managed to ins uh, insulate the Israeli population from the consequences of the occupation fairly effectively, right? You know, every so often they have to deal with some bottle rockets getting fired at them, but you know, the, the, there isn't really a, a military threat posed by the Palestinians. Uh, and I think, you know, like maybe the youth are breaking away from, uh, uh, from the traditional political parties, but you know, in a place like the Gaza Strip, you know, a group like Hamas has an iron control on on, on politics in that uh, that country. Mm -hmm. People people can, uh, you know, people can be against them, but you know, like it's very difficult to challenge them. Like I'm very like a negative person, so you know, don't listen to me. Uh, but um, <laughs> well, but we're yeah, going on three hours. What say you, Pascal Robert? Revolution, if you're willing to fight for it and organize for it. If you're not, don't talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. And what is that? that? That's the thing, though. It's like you, when you say those kind of vague words like fight for it, people really mean like, are you going to go beat up a cop? No, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I, listen, I'm at the stage where are you willing to go into a neighborhood and teach someone how to literally organize to get water turned on in the community? Thank you. In Flint? Mm hmm. I think we're it's more revolutionary to me right now than talking about all this other other Mau Mau S crap, quite honestly. Mm. Some would interpret that as I don't believe in telling people who are working right. 12 hours a day, barely able to pay their bills, you need to start a revolution. My question, what I like to do is tell them, well, what exactly do you want politically? I don't want to tell them anything. I want to ask them, what do you want politically? Mm -hmm. What do you want that this system is not giving you? Yo, and these all, are, I think we project what our expectations I, I, yeah. of, 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 of people are without asking them what their demands are. And, and this, there's people that are actually doing that. Look at Ujima Medics in Chicago. They're actually doing that. Free Dem Foundations, whose folks I just met in New Orleans, they're actually doing that. To, you know, two, two guys, uh, um, Jerome Morgan being one of them, that, that they actually, they, they together, they serve 15 plus years um, under wrongful convictions, they were they actually got got um, freed through the Innocence Project, right? And the first mm -hmm. thing they did was they started this project in New Orleans that does exactly what Pascal is describing, right? Ujima Medics doing something exactly the same, building on like a Black diasporic, you know, women's doula abolitionist caretaking tradition, um, like literally saving lives, literally training people how to save lives in Southside in Black Southside Chicago. So that that that's the shit that we're talking about that I'm talking about, right? And I don't know if revolution is the right term or not. I don't care. I don't really care about that word that much, right? Like I like the word, right? I don't know. I don't know if I'm interested. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if, if I'm interested in participating in some kind of academic exercise to define yeah. that shit. But like I am interested in what I said earlier, which is people who are creating these sites of radical autonomy that are life making, that are world making, that are directly confronting the violent power of the state. I don't deny, don't, for me, I can only speak for me. We are trying to create, as far as I'm concerned, a new society, a new reality that is more humane, that is divorced from all of the oppressions, racial, gender, sexual, militarism, ex exploitations that we've seen that have brought this war to this condition. Developing that new society is going to require for us to put something in the consciousness of the people to make them understand that this does not work. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that all of this talk is inspirational and wonderful and great, but many of us, myself included, have not done the work. And there are others who have done it to talk to the people. Mm -hmm what they demand from the system yeah. that is governing them uh, there's not one way to do it though pascal i think i think you i think you are you're, you're 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 selling yourself and your own work and our own work short in a certain kind of way so let me just let me contextualize it by saying let me just qualify by saying this i'll talk about myself i have a very narrow fucking skill set you know what i mean there's not a lot of shit i know how to do right so, so the question that I feel I'm asked by the people around me, 
-hmm. who ask for me to do things with them and for that matter to do things for them is to weaponize what small skill set i have to make a fucking contribution to the team so to speak to the community so to speak right so i don't i don't see how what y'all do here as being different from that like the fact the, fa the fact that we can induce like a lively debate conversation where we cuss and yell at each other about matters as serious as burning police stations down and the implications what the definition of revolution might be what the fuck is going on in palestine but you know what i mean like that that this is service this is a contribution again it's a narrow particular type of contribution but i think it is vital and i think it contributes to the kind of rhetoric and narrative that the so-called left cannot get its mind and hearts around to this point and i think y'all got that you're doing it we're actually trying to do it we're trying it's, anyway well, you know there's a lot of circle jerking that goes on in these in these corners and uh i think what's wrong with the circle jerk jason what's <laughs> the circle jerk? We're, circle we're, jerk, just jerking off together uh the people's look, jerk off why you again, gotta apologize before, to circle jerk <laughs> before we go i want to i want to remind people <laughs> when we talk about revolution and i want to say something serious uh when I was talking with a good friend of mine who works with the unhouse where I worked, um, there's a park in Berkeley called People's Park. Yes. And Dylan, those people got cleared out and they were trying to yes. put them in permanent supportive housing. And it's a struggle. Yeah. It's a struggle like you wouldn't believe. And I asked my friend, my good friend, wonderful woman, after I made fun of her, for asking her how many times she got called dumb white bitch today because you know it's part of the job right i said how many times are you dumb white bitch today <laughs> and uh she said you want to know what the real problem is i said what don't nobody want to work that's the truth my friend that's the truth don't nobody want to work the truth. That's so the truth. that's the truth there i don't know what the starting pay is i know it's 20 something an hour if you're in the Bay Area and you want to be part of some sort of revolution, you want to say you put your stamp down, you're making a change as someone that worked in that environment, that was able to create a little mini school. We had all kinds of classes. We tried to make that motherfucker into a resort. If that's the kind of shit you want to do, there's work. There's all kind of work. Are you ready for it? I'm, I'm not saying don't sure. do it. I'm just saying be ready. Yeah, why not redistribute some of your own labor if you already have a job too? Mm. One of the few, again, I have a very narrow skill set. One of the few things I can do is redistribute labor and resources from my site of polluted, toxified colonial employment to people like those working on such projects. So Jason, get in touch because if I can provide for example, honorary to people to come and mm -hmm. talk on some Zoom thing one day. Oh, it's... I can provide a healthy honorarium for some people. I'm just a little, little. It's, it's just. I mean, you know, you know, you know, we couldn't get. You know, we couldn't get when I was there. And I, and again, I, I didn't ask super specific questions, but they're having problems getting. We couldn't get drug counseling. Right. Every day, Cass was like, "Hey, can we get AA?" And there's legal. Right. You can't just set up your own AA. It's not that simple. And that was frustrating. I could get people Obama phones all day long, but you know, getting them, you know, multiple cats asking you, can you please have a meeting? So if you guys want to get involved, there's all these places are by you, especially if you live in a major metropolitan area, there is somewhere by you where they just need you an hour a day. Motherfuckers need you, man. That being said, thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Gene Bajlan. And you're not inviting me back again anytime soon, are you? <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I wore out my welcome today. Look, all right. Look, I hey, love you all. Hey, real talk. <laughs> real I'll say this on air. I'll fucking call my shot on air. You know I live like two and a half hours from you. Oh, you're that close? I'm in Mexico. No, this I know, but I didn't know where Mexico's a big place. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not in mainland. I'm in Baja. Okay. Is that? I think you're. I think you're. If you're, because you're in Riverside, right? I'm mean, gonna say exactly where, but I know you're in Riverside. I'm in Corona. I'm in Corona. 
Oh, maybe Kauia, like... Tongva land. It's closer. It's closer to you than Riverside is actually. Is it? No. Nope. Yeah, I'm an unincorporated unincorporated Corona. Uh, you know, you know, you're always welcome to come hang out. No, I'm. Don't lie. You're welcome here. Though. Why would I lie? Why would I, first of all, I don't got a because I'm Filipino. I, look, I'm Filipino. I'm therefore, by definition, by your own definition, I am kind of not welcome in a way. <laughs> You're doing this is a great Filipino ban. He said it. He talked <laughs> about the saying. Filipino ban. I think it's, it only applies. I, I don't to give a fuck band. about your ban, by the way. I don't give a fuck about your ban. So I might just show up at your house anyway. So I'm just, you know. He's always trying to get people to come to his house. He's the right guy. Nobody wants to nobody wants to come visit, man. Nobody wants to come visit. That's not true. You've had several visitors. Who look, some of these loose women want to come down here for the view. Oh my god. What are, they, <laughs> what are they viewing? That's why we're at fucking seven billion p eight billion people. <laughs> That's why we're at eight billion people. Oh, let, oh also, can we say this on air? In a thousand years, Jason's gonna be like Genghis Khan, like fifty percent of the world's population will be able to trace their DNA back to Jason Miles. <laughs> 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 he'll be like the he'll be like, you know, they'll dig his body up and it's like and it, this is proto humanitas the progenitor of at least 70 percent of the world's population today <laughs> podcaster known as jason miles and his time. for some reason all these people were part filipino <laughs> <laughs> there's something he liked about dark hair and adobo <laughs> uh Seriously, we have to congratulate Dylan. Hold on, let me get the right thing. Wait, what I... about what about congratulate me? What? Hold on. I don't Who's deserve son? congratulations. Yeah. Got into Dartmouth. Plays no, baseball. But he's there. He's, right. He just he just we already talked about that. Pascal. No, Pascal was... I talked about it with you online as a as oh, a man okay, online. Okay. okay. We never but got to there. announce he just, it. No, he's he's he just he just opened the door and was looking in here while I was talking to you. He just came <laughs> home. He just came home from the fall term. Well, he, he does. He plays term. baseball. The baseball player that's 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 how he got there so dylan is a baseball coach by the way too so that's no no, no i'm a baseball i'm what they i'm like i'm like more of a um more of an abusive personal manager than a coach all right <laughs> if i was to be totally honest yes there is a batting cage in my backyard full size yes seven so feet yes long. so coach you're welcome coach there dylan. anytime coach dylan uh you know we need to bring you on the sports show actually I'll, I'll, I'll be all over that. We're bringing a sports show back Monday. Robert Booth, my son plays shortstop. Robert Booth, my son plays shortstop. At Dartmouth. So Dylan Dylan Dartmouth. is a baseball coach for, not the high school, it's like a- Yes, a Dylan Marinovich. That's my that's my dude right there. Dylan Marinovich, you know, um, fucking King Richard. Like, those are my those are my role models. I will never live up to that. But hey, he's there. So just I'm so you guys know, I wanted to give you, I wanted to give you dad props. You never got your official dad props. Thank you. I'll accept those flowers. Dad props. That's all. So, yes, JB, the red zone is coming back Monday. That's my bad. I've been busy with this project, been busy with the live show. We've been busy with a lot of stuff. Um, I'm being able to catch up. Thank you, Gene Bajlan. Thank you, Pascal. And of course, thank you, MT. For Love you, Gene. Love you, Pascal. Love you, Jason. All right, brother. Me I'm serious about coming Hello. down to Mexico, brother. Okay. Invite me on again soon. For this sure. Is, this, is, this is good shit right here. Okay. Peace, All right, Dylan. Dylan. Thank you, Dylan. Peace. All right, y'all. Dylan Rodriguez, professor at University of California, Riverside. Whew. It's always fun when we have a spirited discussion. Matt and David are going to be like, these motherfuckers went an extra hour and a half. Splooging all over that channel. <laughs> They're going to cut that shit right off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what racism looks like when they cut the extra hour and a half off. All right, Gene, I don't know where your kids are, but they're not in there, uh, as Jordan Dubin calls them, open air prisons. No, they're not in their open air prisons. They're in bed. Zal has made me watch Red, is it? It's about a, a, a Canadian Chinese girl who turns into a red panda. Oh, man. Phoenix made me watch that when we went, when I went to go visit him. 
I've and, watched uh, it five times now. My my daughter, my daughter was like, Dad, Phoenix needs to watch Red. So you know, my daughter and Phoenix and my daughter's boyfriend, they all you know, forced me to watch Red. And maybe it's because I'm like an older father now. I get emotional at all these Disney movies. Did you tell us? Have you watched Coco? Yes. Remember, I get emotional your... watching Moana. They'll put your picture on the ofrenda. Oh, dude, Coco. Which would name another one? The Up. one with the toys. Up. The Toy Story. No, I never really got into Toy Story, but Up, I, I fucking cried like a baby in the theater watching Up. Pascal doesn't cry at Disney movies because he doesn't watch them. No, I don't watch this shit. <laughs> My daughter says she looks like Moana, and she does kind of look like Moana. Jordan Dubin says, is Red a show for communist uh, children? No. 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 But if Gene had to watch it five times in a row, I know he's got an ass full of that movie. Mm hmm. <laughs> Gene, you know what you got to do, Gene? When I do with Phoenix, I go, let's watch something else. That doesn't work. <laughs> you didn't try to watch like Sleeping Beauty or. Nope, he won't watch it. Brave. One, one thing he could, there's only two, he will watch. He has one Disney movie he will watch until he's done with it. Or I have to watch Ryan's World. And I don't trust Ryan's mom one bit. I'm like, what are you doing on here exploiting your children, Ryan's World? You know? She's kind of a horrible woman. It's like, what's going on with Ryan's World and Ryan's World's mom? But yeah, it's very not cool. But uh, I'm trying to convince Zal to watch... Uh, Andor with me, but he says it's boring. Well, this is what I did with Phoenix. I shit you not. At night, when it was about bedtime, we dedicated it was like two months to watching all the Star Wars movies and the shows in chronological order. And episode one is very colorful. Mm -hmm. And I have a picture or video of it somewhere. He stopped right in, and he was maybe a little younger than what Zal is now. And he stopped right in the living room as we were watching it. He was just like, oh, what is this? And it just sucked him in. And, and we got to watch all of it. He loved Mandalorian. We watched well, it all. Well, Zal episode. watched Alien with me. And Jeez. he kept calling the alien, it's the dog. I was like, it's not a dog, but you know, good attempt son he's like it's the dog and he's like is the dog hungry i was like yeah the dog's hungry uh jay zacharias i'm working on getting michael harris back on the show and we're going to do a stream on andor and i don't know if it's going to be a tir show or a pop life show do a pop life um, show. Oh, Derek, that, Barn. Derek it's too late brother we've been on for three hours yeah. yes indeed he's <laughs> very angry. Yeah, he's very angry. i'm very angry today and he needs a cuddle. Poor Derek. Is he out of school right now? No, he's probably finishing off the semester. Oh, fuck. That's why he's mad. He's like, these motherfucking kids and they punk-ass parents. <laughs> All right, Varn. Varn, I'm going to look forward to... Are you coming by during the Christmas break? No. Oh. Oh, is he coming by? Who knows? Varn, you should come by for Christmas break. You can have... Uh, a champagne jam. Gene Bajlan and Pascal never want to join me for Christmas. They have families. Oh, celebrate Christmas. You celebrate Muslim angry Christmas? No. no we, go, we celebrate Shabi Yelda in our house, which is the Persian winter equinox. Like good pagans. Okay, I don't know what weird devil shit you do at your house. But uh, we're going to have a good Mexican Jesus Christmas. By we, I mean me. All right, guys. We've been going for three hours. We haven't done a three hours streaming forever. I hope you guys enjoyed all the free champagne. None of the fat. None of the fat. You got a hardcore show. There was no dick jokes this whole time.
we were very serious the whole time. We had we had a back and forth. This is a fun show. Pascal, Gene, love you guys. I might see Pascal Saturday. I think he's wiped. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> Did you do the reading? Look at him. <laughs> Not yet. And we are out. Oh, thank you, Matt and David. It's been so long. I forgot you guys were even on the show. Thank you, Matt and David. Thank you, everybody watching on Left Reckoning's channel. If you're watching on TIR, please go to Left Reckoning's YouTube. Hit like as well. Let's get both of these numbers up in the algorithm so this content is more in people's faces on the internet. And we are out.